Hi, and welcome to another session of the Microsoft Virtual Academy. In this session, we're going to take a look at some software development fundamentals. This will actually focus on some preparation for our MTA, Microsoft Technology Associate Certification Exam, 98-361. And we'll cover some core fundamentals that you'll need to understand as you get started in software programming. So let's go ahead and introduce who your presenters are today. My name is, uh, is Jerry O'Brien, and I'm a technical content development manager here at Microsoft. Uh, I've been focusing on the developer and the SQL Server platforms for some time. I'm also a content author. Uh, in a little over 18 years of experience, eight and a half of that here at Microsoft, and I'm a Microsoft certified trainer, been a software developer uh, and a consultant in the industry, written numerous books on IT topics, uh, and actually written a few courses as well. Currently program in Visual Basic, C Sharp, Java, and Objective-C. And the most important part I like to have at the last is I'm a lifelong learner. So like you, I enjoy learning about technology. That's kind of where I'm at today. I continue to continuously learn on a daily basis. So now I'll let Paul introduce himself. Hi, Hi my name is Paul Party, and uh, I'm a uh, content development lead at uh, Microsoft. Um, I've been uh, in the software industry for about 20 years and doing programming um, most of that time. And uh, I started out programming in uh, Visual Basic and moved to scripting. And, uh, and then I moved into object-oriented languages like C Sharp and spent most of my time in that language. I've also programmed against SQL Server, so that gives me some experience with databases as well. Um, I uh, co-authored a book on Microsoft Access many years ago and uh, recently published an app to the uh, Windows 8 App Store called Movie Notes, which I'm very proud of. Great. Thanks, Paul. And welcome. Glad to have you here on my team as we present this MVA. So a quick overview of what we'll cover today. Uh, in our software development fundamentals, we've got about seven modules to go through. So over the next few hours, we'll take a look at some general software development. This is where we'll focus on some of the non-coding aspects of what a software developer might have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we'll take a look at uh, the application lifecycle management and a little uh, bit of a discussion on how you might evaluate technical specifications. Then we'll start getting into kind of the meat of what we're going to do in module two, which is core programming. And this will focus a lot on how a computer stores and processes information, uh, what you expect to see in terms of working with some of the different aspects of programming like decision structures and repetition and how programming errors creep into your code and how you can work with those uh, successfully and, uh, to basically get your program up and running again. Module 3 uh, takes a look at object-oriented programming and the thing that's kind of interesting about the way software development has, has um, changed over the years, folks now start looking more at trying to model real-world objects in the code that they're writing and object-oriented programming gives us that uh, ability to do that. So we'll take a look at how uh, we can model those real-world objects, how object-oriented programming uh, plays a very important part in what you'll do as a software developer. Then the next couple of modules, four, five, and six, will give you the opportunity to take a look at examples of some of the types of applications you might be developing. So we'll focus on web applications, take a look at what core, uh, just basic HTML pages look like, and then take a look at what an, a web application is, how it's hosted on the different platforms, then we'll give you an example of some of the different desktop applications that you might be focusing on. So even though the web uh, has become you know, relevant over the years, folks spend a lot of time on the internet now, there are still applications written for laptops and desktop computers, so it's important that you understand what those are and what you might be uh, involved in developing from those, th that perspective. Uh, also in Module 6, we'll take a look at databases because I would say about 99% of your applications today focus on data and you have to access that data somewhere most of the time it's in a database, so we'll talk about databases, we'll give you a, a demo of SQL Server, show you how you can extract some data, insert and update information in a database, talk briefly about how programmers will connect to it, and then finally we'll finish off with a quick little discussion on, after you know, you've basically seen everything in this session, is this for me? Do I want to pursue software development as, as a career? Is this something that interests me? And it doesn't always have to be a career. Maybe you're just looking at it from a hobby perspective, and that's perfectly fine as well. But we'll present some resources for you at the end, show you some links to some training, uh, certifications, and how you can ramp up on some more core fundamentals. Obviously, we want to do a little bit of uh, expectation setting up front. We want to let you know what we expect uh, you to have in terms of a mindset and maybe a skill set before you step through this. 
Software development is not always an easy process. Some of the um, concepts that you'll learn or as you go through learning new programming languages may be a little different than what you're used to, so there's some things that you might want to be aware of. Uh, we've listed two bullet points here for target audience. And first of all, A, it's a desire to get started in software development. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't be here. So that's kind of important, you know, that this, this is what you want to do or maybe it's something you think you want to do. So you should have that in mind. You should also be a little bit technically savvy. And, and this is kind of an ambiguous bullet point. What does technically savvy mean? Does that mean I need to have an engineering degree? Do, do I need to understand at the deepest level how a computer functions internally? No, that's not what we're saying. But you should be able to understand technology. You should be able to know how to turn on a computer, execute programs, you know, start them up and, and find your way around file systems and things like that. That's kind of what we're, we're talking about. We do list some suggested prerequisites. And, and uh, the first one is kind of logical thinkers. That's a little bit of uh, an interesting bullet point as well because what is a person who thinks logically? And uh, as Paul and I were discussing this the other day, I kind of brought up a little bit of a scenario for him in, in thinking about most people have a typical morning routine. So you get up in the morning, you know, the alarm clock goes off, you turn it off, hop in the shower, you get dressed, you get down, you have breakfast perhaps, you hop on a bus or in your car and you head off to work. And for most people, that's it. We're happy with that and, and that's all we need to worry about. But as a software developer or a computer programmer, you need to dig a little deeper into the concepts of that. Um, so logically thinking, you're going to have to start breaking that down into discrete steps. The alarm clock goes off in the morning. Well, there's a decision to be made. Obviously, you're going to turn it off because it's annoying, but the decision is, do I pay attention to it and get out of bed and go to work, or do I play hooky today and I'm just going to stay off you know, and, and, and stay home sick and not go to work today? Uh, so, you know, you start getting deeper into these decisions when you're, I'm going to take a shower is my next step. Well, there's some logical thinking from that. Is the shower available? If it's not, what am I going to do next? That's the kind of thing that we're referring to when we say logical thinking. You have to start breaking um, things that you take for granted down into discrete steps and thinking about them from a different perspective. It would be nice if you do have some experience with scripting or beginner programming tasks, although it's not technically necessary here because we're going to be showing you some code for the samples and the code that we're going to show you may be foreign to you if you've never seen a programming language before so if you've got a little bit of that experience then some of the concepts might be a little bit easier to see from that coding perspective um, the ability to understand patterns programming deals a lot with patterns in the code itself we we'll talk about how repetition structures create patterns as we repeat and iterate through different loops we can also talk about how patterns are present in things such as numbering systems and the different sets and the different aspects of, of the code that you'll deal with. Um, it'll become more apparent when we start focusing on things like our data structures, when we look at arrays and queues and lists and stacks and things like that. You'll have, uh, need to have the ability to see how patterns um, are present in these things and work with them specifically. And then finally, a grasp of mathematical concepts. Now, you don't have to be a mathematician. You, you don't need to have uh, you know, gone through university and gotten a degree in mathematics, certainly. But understanding some of the general concepts, such as what is a set? In, in, you know, in programming, we deal a lot with sets, which are specific values of numbers, text characters, what have you. Um, and you should also understand numbering systems, because when we start dealing with the data types that a computer stores, and how it stores them through the binary uh, concepts. You'll need to understand the different numbering systems that we have and how you work with those specifically in the programming language you're choosing. Because a computer can't store infinite amounts of information, our number systems in computers are limited to certain values. So an understanding of that really helps as you start uh, working through your programming career. Now, obviously, you're here on, on the Microsoft Virtual Academy. If you haven't already uh, joined the MVA community, you should sign up. You should register for this. It's a great opportunity to get some free online training targeted at you know, developers and, and IT professionals. Uh, we've got over 1 million registered users on the system already. It's a very popular platform. We've got some great training on here. Take a look at it. Um, you know, we are, we're always updating the content on here so that we become relevant to what it is that you're looking for. Uh, if you see something that's not on there, hey, use the contact information on the website and suggest some topics. We're more than happy to add them. So again, welcome to the MVA community. And uh, let's go ahead and take a look at our first module. So we're going to focus on general software development here. And again, as I mentioned from um, the intro, general software development will focus on a couple of key aspects that are not specifically related, related directly to coding. So you're not going to be writing code or we're not going to be presenting code in this one. But it's more around the processes that you can expect to encounter as you start uh, working as a software developer. 
These can be as an individual developer or they can be as you're working in a larger shop, such as you know, here at Microsoft as, as a software developer as well. So we'll take a look at the application lifecycle management and we'll also take a look at how to interpret application specifications. So first of all, an application lifecycle management. Again, this is something that is not specific to coding, but it is a process that we use in the industry to help us understand how software is created and how we go through the um, implementation, designing, testing it, deploying, and managing it. So what you typically find in the industry is a diagram that looks similar to this. Now we have five discrete boxes on here requirements, design, development, test, and maintain. And this is what you'll typically find listed as an application lifecycle management. Some people call it a software development lifecycle. We could even call this a product lifecycle management. Um, and and uh, it's not specific to software development because what it does is it focuses on, again, it's a process. It's, it's a key process that helps us get to where we need to be from our, our software development lifecycle. We take a look at the uh, box on the top is requirements, and typically this is considered to be the first step in this whole iterative process. Realistically, there's actually one box that we don't see here that we could have added, which is one called Envision. So typically before we de decide we're going to create a new product or a new software application, somebody has to have a need for it. And this might be a business, a company, it might even be yourself. If you're going to be somebody who writes your uh, Windows Phone applications or iPad applications, you're the one who's going to envision that product. This is, I, I want to create a software application that does X. That's envisioning. That's essentially what it is. Once you've come up with that vision, you've come up with that idea that you say, I want to create this application to do X, you've then got to sit down and figure out what the requirements for that application are. And what we mean by requirements is there are specific feature sets. We want this application to perform something. We want it to do something. We want an end result from it. And as a result, you'll come up with the requirements that say, this is how I want the application to work. This is what I want it to do. The requirements typically end up being a requirements document. Um, if you're developing this for somebody else, you'll typically sit with uh, somebody that we call a product owner. And that product owner could be the company you're developing the application for they'll give you the specific requirements that they're looking for, what they want the application to do and the, the business problems that they're trying to solve, and then you will document those in the requirements document itself. Once that's completed, you might be the person who's creating the design in the next step. The design is, could be done through uh, use of a software architect, who is, is typically somebody who understands the software development process really well but also understands the technologies that you'll build into this and they will create a software design talking about the different technologies they'll use to create an application that solves the requirements and the business problem for the user. There are different terms used for the software architect. Uh, Microsoft also uses a term called a pro uh, program manager. Um, they'll typically sit down, read through the requirements, and create something known as a functional specification. We'll see that in the next slide when we talk about the application spec, uh, a couple of different names for it. But essentially, we're creating a design for the application that might say, you know, uh, how does the application function, and how are we going to create it um, on the specific platform that we're using. Another key aspect of this when we talk about the design is we might end up dealing with things called storyboards, which basically kind of dictate the flow through the application, how users will, will work with the application and the different components that make up the application itself. And those will also consist typically of mock-ups where somebody will take a design program. Oftentimes it could even be, you know, the back of a napkin. Somebody's just drawing a picture with, you know, a pen and paper and saying this is what we think the user interface will look like. Um, that's all a part of the design process. Once that's completed, we'll then pass that off to the software developers, the people who are actually going to write the code. They may or may not take that design document and then go through writing something called a technical specification. Again, this is another document that they go through the process of creating in their favorite word processor or some other application where they want to store the document. And what it does is it creates for them a way of uh, dictating how they're going to actually create that functionality in code. So the functional spec doesn't get into how we implement it. It just simply says how we want the program to work. The technical specification that a developer might create will say how they're going to do it, what technologies they're going to use, um, how, you know, what types of, of data structures they'll implement in there, 
uh, whether they're going to access data locally, whether it's going to be on a back-end server, all of these different aspects typically form the technical specification. And once that's done, the coders can actually start writing the code itself. So they can start doing the development of the application. Now, the next phase talks about test. And one of the things that's interesting about test is we can kind of break it up into two different aspects. There's testing during the development process itself. And what this involves is something called unit testing. Um, most of the times your developers will create something called a unit test, which is code that they write that tests little pieces, of discrete pieces of functionality that they're writing. So they can run tests before the code is even completely finished. Then we also have in the development process a whole test team and their responsibility is to look at the functional specification, know and understand what the program is supposed to do, and then write automated test routines that go in to check to make sure the code executes what it's supposed to do. So if we have a, uh, let's say a looping a structure within our code that's designed to iterate through a collection of items and output a specific value, they'll write an automated routine that checks to make sure that that looping structure does what it's supposed to do. We also have other aspects known as user acceptance testing or business acceptance testing. So we refer to those as UAD and BAT. Uh, some people call it BAD, but it depends on your pronunciation of it. But what that is, is the code is almost at a state where we're ready to release it, and then we'll let the users play with it, we'll let the, the business take a look at it and make sure that it meets the, the requirements that they laid out, and we'll test it to make sure that it works in the user's hands. And one of the things that I used to tell the uh, students that I taught in, in computer programming was, you could create the greatest application in the world and think you have absolutely no bugs in your code, and you've tested it and it works, but that's because you know how it functions. And you give it to the user, and probably within about five minutes, they're gonna do something you didn't expect them to do and they've just broke your, your application. So user acceptance testing is very important. Uh, to give you a, a better idea of where you might find that is, you know, consider beta tests. Uh, so beta software that gets released and, and Microsoft does this all the time. We release beta versions of the products for people to test and kind of bang on and we collect feedback over issues that they run into, uh, bugs that might pop up in the code itself and we fix them before we do the final release of the product. Our next phase talks about maintaining the application once it's, it's actually available. Um, again, there's, there's an extra little box that kind of sits between the test and the maintain that we don't have here. And sometimes it's put in there, sometimes it's not because it's kind of implicit. Before we maintain the software, we have to deploy it. So this means we're getting it out to the customer. They now have it in their hands. We've deployed it to their, to their systems. It's running on their computers and they're ready to start using it on a day-to-day -day basis. Now the maintenance phase means that we could have in our application um, instrumentation, which means that as the application runs, we record specific uh, pieces of information about how it operates. Maybe it's for performance checking. Uh, it could be if there are, are other bugs or errors that pop up that we didn't discover in the testing phase. We write them out to a log so that later on we can look at it and see what those issues were. It's important for that maintenance phase because software applications don't just get written and deployed and forgotten about while users you know, go through the process of using them in their day-to-day -day lives. We typically maintain that and what we mean by maintaining it is we're fixing bugs or we're coming out with the next major release. Over the past few years, one of the biggest things that we've you know, had to focus on, not just here at Microsoft, but all companies doing software development, is security of the software itself. And you know, we release patches on a regular basis. If you're not familiar with something called Patch Tuesday, uh, that's probably, you know, the reason why your computer reboots on a Wednesday morning or, or late Tuesday night if you leave it running because we're sending out patches to software as we discover issues and problems with, with the, the Microsoft software that you use. That's a, a part of maintaining. It might also be that we're creating new versions of the product. So again, if you take a look at, you know, the, the Microsoft Windows operating system, how many versions have we gone through over the years from that? That's an example of maintaining the software that we've deployed. So again, this is your application lifecycle management, not really involved with coding, but it specifically talks about a process that you can expect to be involved in as a software developer. Now, Jerry, before you move on, um, you said something uh, before interesting that uh, <clears throat> this process applies to many different industries. So you might see this model in auto, you know, the automotive industry or anybody who makes a widget or a piece of hardware. Um, what might be a little bit different about software is that uh, software developers might go through this cycle multiple times um, in a week or a month. You're working through requirements, you're working through design for new features that you're building. So even though in that maintaining phase you're fixing bugs, you might actually go through this entire cycle multiple times as you're developing new features, which I think is a little bit 
bit different than un other industries when we think about how software is developed. Yeah, and, and that's a good important point, Paul. So, you know, thanks for bringing it up because one of the things I did forget to mention was if you look at this diagram that we have for the application lifecycle management, you'll see the little arrows between the boxes and, and it kind of cycles. So that lets you know that this is an iterative process. We, we, we can be doing this continuously over and over again. Um, and as Paul mentioned, for you know different industries outside of software development, it, they may do this whole process for creating a part for a car, Correct. and they'll they'll design and, and create the part itself, and then they'll test, and it doesn't work. Well, we got to go through this whole process again. So, yeah, great interjection. Thanks, Paul. All right. So next, uh, we'll take a quick look at an application specification. Now, um, sometimes these are called functional specifications. There sometimes there are different names for them, but Again, this is, is a part of a process. This is a part of the software development uh, lifecycle process we just explained. And you'll find these come in different forms. And the example that I'll give you here is, is just one that I was actually involved in. Uh, I wrote this one up for an internal application that um, I was working on, not as a developer, but as, as a program manager here a little while ago, uh, probably about a year or two back. And to give you an example of what it might look at, you know, I've, I'm showing you here, you know, I have. Section four or section five, there's obviously three sections ahead of it. Um, so you'll end up with things in it that are like an executive summary of what this is, uh, you know, why we're doing this, and then there will be something that says the current state, um, what's the issue, what's the problems we're trying to solve, and then there might be another section that says how we're going to get to solving this problem. But the key parts of what the developer will focus on are, you know, these two sections that we're looking at here. So there's a feature list. And, and then there's a feature overview. And if you look at the feature list, you see we've got some high level bullet points here and then we kind of drill down a little bit deeper into some of the other bullet points. And to give you a kind of an idea of what the application spec is all about, you know, looking at item number six, we're, we're talking about price checking. This is a, a specific discrete functionality that we need this, this process to look at. And so we need to validate pricing. We see as a part of that, there are three different aspects. We need to get the product pricing from a spreadsheet. Now, in, in this case, it was from a spreadsheet, but it could be from any other data source. We want to take a look at all of the courses that we published on that system and pull the pricing back from that. And then we need to do a price comparison. And it's just a validation routine to make sure that what we have set in our pricing back end is reflected on the pricing front end. So also notice that there's no specific implementation details of how we're going to do this this is just saying this is a functionality. This is what we need the program to do. We get a little more uh, in-depth, if you will, in the feature overview. And what we talk about here is kind of a story about how these features are intended to work. So the bullet points are very high level. Developers can come back and focus on those as a reference point. But the feature overview really talks more about you know, the problems we're trying to solve and, and how we want to get there. So again, you might find different versions of you know, functional specs or application specs out there. Um, remaining sections that you don't see in this document are other things that we would create, such as user stories. Um, there's all kinds of, of object-oriented programming um, designs that we can add in here. We can use tools such as Microsoft Visio to create uh, use case diagrams where we show little actors and how they interact with the different components of the system and different things like that. So this is not anywhere near a complete application specification. Uh, they could be typically 20, 30 or more pages worth of documentation uh, depending on the complexity of the project itself. Again, it's just designed to give you an idea of what you can expect to be reading for you to translate what the, co or what the application is intending to do and how you would take a look at those from the perspective of a developer ready to write code for it. So. Yeah, and this, documents like these are typically uh, created in the first two phases of that cycle, that life cycle that uh, Jerry talked about earlier. Um, I also think it's important in the design phase to think in terms of um, two different aspects of a program. So you're going to write a program where there's parts of that program that the user will never see. It's just functionality. The program will do certain things. Um, but then there's also the parts that the users interact with, uh, and that was the that was the aspect of the storyboard that that Jerry had talked about. But every program will have something that the user interacts with, and then something that the user will never see. And I think in that design phase, you figure out what those parts are, and the specification will call out um, the user interface and then the functionality behind the user interface. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and that's a great way of looking at it as well. Um, you know, so it, again, it's. There are different aspects to the software development process, and, and it's not always as simple as you're just sitting there writing code and expect the application to work. So a lot of the times there's there are bits and pieces that come ahead of that. Right? So just to recap, 
In module one, we took a look at the application specification and the application lifecycle management and how those form a part of what a developer will experience in their day-to-day -day, uh, work as they're creating software applications. Um, so, Paul, we finished module one and we hope that you'll come back and join us for module two, which will be coming up next, where we'll focus on some of the core programming concepts, again, kind of laying the foundation for what you'll need to know to start on your software development career. Looking forward to it. Hi, and welcome to the Microsoft Virtual Academy and the presentation on software development fundamentals. My name is Jerry O'Brien, a technical content development manager here at Microsoft, and I'm joined by, believe it or not, my manager, Paul Party. Hi, I'm Paul. Um, I'm a content development lead here at Microsoft. And what we're going to present to you in this session is module number two from the software development fundamentals, and we're going to focus on core programming in this module here. Core programming revolves around the, the foundational concepts that you'll need to know for any programming language that you're working on. Uh, although the samples we'll be demonstrating in here will be in the language C Sharp, uh, they really pertain to just about any programming language that, that you're going to program in uh, in the industry. So in this module, we'll take a look at how computers store and manip manipulate information. Uh, we'll give you a brief introduction to some data structures, which are ways of storing multiple pieces of information inside the computer. We'll introduce you to what an algorithm is and kind of give you a couple of examples for um, what those are, kind of get your mind thinking about how you'll get into the programming aspect of solving problems. And then we'll present some of the uh, core functional aspects of programming, which deal with decision structures how we make decisions in, in the computer program and how we control the flow of our program code. Then we'll talk about repetition, which is one of the things that computers are really great at doing is reiterating and doing something over and over and over again many times without complaining about it. And then we'll talk about one of the things that all developers say they don't need, which is how to handle errors in their program. So we know as software developers, errors do creep in, so we'll talk about what those are and how we can handle those in our, in our uh, programming. So the first aspect we want to take a look at here is computer storage and processing. And this focuses on how a computer stores information and how it processes information so that you can gain a better understanding of why you have to deal with uh, the syntax of programming languages why you have to restrict your data information that you're putting into the computer into certain types. So it kind of explains why we use data types, why there are restrictions and, and limits on what those can be. Uh, so we'll focus on what those specific aspects are and kind of what drives the computers uh, in the background. Now, this is not information that you necessarily really need to know to be successful in programming, but it is great background information and it helps you become a more effective and a more efficient programmer. So computer storage and processing, we, we take a look at it from the perspective of how the computer deals with the information and the data that we'll put into it internally. And it's important to know that computers deal with binary information. So the numbering system that we have on our computer systems focuses on a binary concept. And if you're not familiar with what binary is, it's a uh, basically two discrete phases. There's, we can consider it to be off and on. We might say there's a yes or there's a no, but that gets into different aspects we'll talk about later. Uh, but from the computer's perspective, internally in the circuits, we're either dealing with the presence of a voltage or no voltage. So this is where your binary concepts come from. And we represent those in the computer through a binary numbering system, which focuses on two discrete values, a zero or a one. The ability to represent real-world data that we use, such as the numbers we focus on on a day-to-day -day basis, or the characters, the letters that we have in our alphabets, um, or in, in foreign languages, such as, you know, simplified Chinese, or in, in, in the Japanese languages, even in, uh, you know, other European languages we might run across. We have to have a way of representing those character sets, um, and, and that's what they're referred to. These are the characters or the symbols that make up the words and the letters that we use. And in order to represent those internally in the computer, a zero or a one isn't sufficient, so we have to represent them with uh, multiples of these zeros and ones. And they're represented in things called bits and bytes. So a zero or a one is known as a bit in a computer. And if we combine 
multiple bits together, we start to create other representations such as bytes and megabytes and terabytes, etc. So they grow larger and larger depending on the amount of bits that we've included in it. Um, on this particular slide, you'll see on the left-hand side, we're showing a representation of binary numbers. So those are the zeros and the ones. The bottom figure represents the CPU, so the central processing unit for the computer. And then the top one represents the memory that you might have in the computer. We don't have representation for long-term storage, which are your hard disk drives and your optical drives, such as DVD-ROMs and things like that. But it's important to note that when a computer executes a program, it cannot execute the code directly from a storage device such as a hard drive. It has to access that information directly in computer memory. Now, computer memory is expensive, uh, relatively, uh, when you take a look at the price of storage such as hard drives and DVD drives. And so, therefore, your computer is not going to have infinite amounts of memory. We only have a certain amount of memory that we can actually use in the computer and to, you know, to store that information. So that kind of talks a little bit about the restrictions that we'll focus on in the data types a little bit later on in this presentation. But it's important for you to understand we can only load a finite amount of information into the computer memory at any one point in time. So we talked about the representation of the characters, strings, the values that we use on a day-to-day -day basis for words and sentences. And on the right-hand side of our screen, we can see something that's known as an ASCII chart. And this goes back to the days of, of uh, you know, long before Windows, long before the computers that you're using today. And the ASCII chart was a way of representing values such as special symbols, punctuation marks, letters, and numbers in our binary system. Um, and you'll see representations in here. You'll see the, under the uh, column on the left-hand side, you'll see decimal representations. You'll see hexadecimal representations, which are another numbering system that we use in computers. And then you'll see either the characters or the codes in the remaining two columns. And you can see that that's how the numbers are actually represented within the computer itself. And you'll see this is uh, indicative of what we might choose or see in a normal uh, North American um, language infrastructure, so the English language. We've got punctuation marks, we've got numbers, and we have upper and lower case letters and some special characters. And those are represented with the specific codes in the computer. So this is basically how a computer stores uh, the representation of these letters and numbers by using decimal values or using hexadecimal values inside the computer itself. So, Jerry, programmers aren't going to need to um, program in ones and zeros, right? They're not typing in ones and zeros as they're programming. So how does a modern programming language relate to that decimal system? Um, what, what does the programming language do? Yeah, so that's a very important point, Paul. And, and you say that programmers don't have to write in zeros and ones they did at one time. That's so fair. fortunately today we don't have to deal with that. Uh, in the early days of computers they used punch card systems where the, the binary values were represented on these little paper cards. They had little holes punched out in them and they had stacks and stacks of these cards that they would take and feed into the computer and if they were out of order the program didn't work correctly. So fortunately now we have something known as, as programming languages which are a little higher level and the programming language allows you to write your code in an English style syntax if you will um, and then we can represent data, we can represent instructions through these binary concepts in the computer. And the programming language um, actually, again, we're writing it in an English style language and there's a compiler in the background that takes those English version instructions or the high level instructions that we write and the data that we include in our program and it, it actually exports it into a binary version that the computer is able to understand. Um, so you don't need to worry about how the compiler takes care of that. We've got developers that write the compilers and developers that are responsible for translating our instructions and code into something that the computer understands. Um, but the other aspect too, and, and to kind of answer another aspect of Paul's question was, once we do the compiling, the, there are specific computer platforms. So if you're looking at uh, you know, the older versions of Apple computers used to run on a, a PowerPC chip. Uh, Windows-based PCs were running on Intel CPUs. The tablets and the smartphones that you're using today operate on Atom CPUs or some other type of a CPU. Those central processing units have specific instruction sets. And so what that means is that inside the CPU and, and the functionality of it, 
it understands what an instruction is versus what the data is that we want to process or, or act on. And so this is how the computer knows whether it's given an instruction that it has to execute or whether it's looking at data that it has to pull out of the, the memory and do some functionality on it. So it all boils down to instruction sets and compilers and the different CPU architectures that we're working with. Again, as you program in things like C Sharp and you know, Visual Basic or C++, Java, whatever your chosen language is, you don't need to worry about that. You'll, you'll focus on the key words that are a part of the language, the syntax for the language, and the data types that you use in it and you use those as the building blocks for your program as you go through uh, writing your code. The compiler handles trans translating all of that information into the machine instruction code. So that's actually a good segue to, to talk about our next slide which focuses on things such as variables, constants, and data types. And these are aspects that you'll need to understand in order to write code successfully in the programming language of your choice. So before we talk about the data types, let's talk about what we use to store this information in the computer. Again, remember that we said the CPUs have specific instructions, and those you can consider to be the keywords in the programming language that you're using. You cannot use these keywords as name storage locations for information. They are the instructions that the computer will execute. So it's important to understand that when we talk about something called a variable. Now, computers deal with memory addresses that are typically in either a binary or a hexadecimal address and if you work with a, a programming language that allows you to um, export or look at a memory address you'll find that those memory addresses are in a hexadecimal format and if you don't understand hex sometimes it can be difficult to read but not only that when you have large amounts of memory the, the hexadecimal strings can get rather large you don't want to have to remember those when you're coding so what we do is we create name storage locations that we refer to in our code that will then be directly mapped to these memory locations. And the compiler and the computer take care of that. You don't have to worry about that mapping. All you need to worry about is I created a name storage location. That's how I'll access that data to either write to it or read it in my program itself. So a variable is something that we use as a name memory location that by its very nature and because of the name variable has the ability for us to change the values that are assigned to it. So we will create a variable name, and we'll see examples of that in some of the demos that we do a little bit later. And the variable name will point to a memory location in the computer, and it will store the data that we say we want to put in it. The key piece about a variable is that we have the ability to store information in that variable. We can read the information back from the variable, and during program execution, we can actually change the content in that variable. So again, this is why we call it a variable, because it's ever-changing. So, so to think of about a variable as just a container of some sort, just a holder. So uh, m most people have filled out an online form at some point. So if you have a form that has first name and last name, you'll have uh, the first name field, we, I'll put in Paul, last name field, I'll put, put in party. Behind those, those fields that you're filling out in that form, there's probably a variable that's holding that data. So, so there would be a variable for Paul, there would be a variable for for party, uh, maybe called first name and last name behind the scenes. Yep. So the, the, the variable is just a holder for that data that you're entering. Exactly. And, and that's really a great example too, Paul, because if you think about filling out a form, whether it be you know, typically an online form, we'll say on a website, um, the information that you put in, we can have multiple users filling out that form. So even though we've got a variable called first name, anybody can be putting their first name into it. So yeah, that's it's right. a great way of looking at it. Uh, the other name memory location that we have to work with in, in our code is known as a constant. And the constant is something that is similar but yet different to the variable. So we know that we can assign values to a variable and we can retrieve them and we can change them. With a constant, we can still assign a value but we have to do it at the time we create the constant itself. We can read the value from that but during program execution we're not able to change the value in there. That's actually an illegal instruction in terms of, of what the computer programming language uh, expects. And, and it will tell you if you attempt to do that in your code itself. But when we talk about constants, we actually have two different types. There are what we call constant values that we would assign in a program, and then there are literal constants. And an example of a literal constant would be the number one or the letter C those are literal constants because we can't change that value. The number one will always be the number one. The letter C will always be the letter C. 
So those are known as literal constants, and you'll see those when you start writing your code. Now, you can assign a literal constant to a variable. So if I create uh, a variable to store a number, and I call it number, I can store the value 1 in that number. But the value 1 will never change, but the value I've stored in number could change. So, it, you know, it's, it, again, it's a little bit different when you, when you look at it from the perspective of what you can and can't do with it. Um, constants are really important in programs because we use them to represent, a lot of the time, literal constant values. So as an example, if you're writing code in a program and your program is going to calculate the area of a circle, well, what's a familiar mathematical constant that we have in there is pi. And instead of you writing in your program each and every time 3.14, you know, 159 and, and this big long uh, pi value, however numbers of precision you want to put in there, you can represent that value in your program by creating a constant called pi and assigning that 3.1419 value to it. So it serves two purposes. One is it creates a named value, which, which makes it easier for you in your code later on because you can use pi instead of putting that number in every time. But it's also a way of kind of self-documenting your code so that when you see that in a formula later on in your program and you see the word pi, you know what it is and you know what it's being used for. Whereas you might look at 3.14 in your program code later and realize, well, is that just a value that I put in here or does it actually represent something? So constants are a great way uh, of representing those values for us. Now let's take a look at our slide again because the last part of this one focuses on data types. And remember how we talked about representing the values in our program that we use in the real world. This comes in the form of numbers and characters and something known as a special type. And we'll talk about the special type last, but we know that we we'll need to store numeric values in a program. Could be for mathematical uh, calculation within the program. They could be used to represent telephone numbers, zip codes, different things like that, right? So, so we need to store numeric values. We also need to store character values. And those can be single characters or they can be words and phrases. And we need a way to represent those in the program. So each programming language represents those values through something known as data types. Some call them intrinsic, some call them implicit, some call them fundamental, but they're a part of, of every programming language. And it's not to say that the values that you're seeing on this slide, the, the specific names in, the, in this left-hand left column of data type, will be exactly the same in the programming language that you choose to program in. These are representative of what C Sharp makes available. So the first one is a byte, um, and really this just allows us to store a single byte, or eight bits of characters. And it's a relatively small type, and we can store uh, values from 0 to 255. That's, that's what we're representing. So it's, it, it stores a numeric value, but also called a byte. And we can use it in a, a bunch of different ways. And as you start getting into programming a little bit later on in, in your career, you, you can actually start to focus on what you can use a byte for, because we can use it for more than just numeric characters or numeric values, sorry. Um, we can use it to store all kinds of other information that is representative of something else. Uh, we, we don't want to go into it here because um, it can get very complex in what you can use byte to represent, but just know that we have a range of 0 to 255, and it will store 8 bits of information or a single byte. Um, the other numeric types, we'll come back to char here in a minute, but we've got a short, an int, a long, a float, and a double. These are all numeric types as well. And those give us the ability to store numbers in our program, but we choose which one we use based on the value that we want to store in that particular variable. Now, at one point in time, when we were writing programs back in the early days, and, and for me, early days are early 1980s, where I was focusing on writing programs for the Commodore VIC-20. Um, some of you may or may not know what that is. Of course, Bing is your friend. Go ahead and take a, uh, look it up and see what it looked like. Uh, it had a whopping two kilobytes of memory available for you to store information in. Uh, that meant that as you were writing your programs, as you wrote your code, you were very cognizant of how much room your data was storing or how, how much storage your, your data required in the program. So when we take a look at these values on this slide, we see that the smaller valued numbers such as the short and the int were, were probably the ones that we would focus on mostly because they stored smaller values, which meant they took up less memory in the computer. Today, you can still focus on choosing the smallest data value possible for your data that you want to store in your, in your uh, program itself. 
But there's a bit of a shift in the programming industry now where we're starting to focus more on developer performance or productivity as opposed to computer performance or productivity. So in other words, if I have to spend my time as a software developer worrying and wondering about whether I should store my value in a short or a double, some people look at that and go, well, that's a waste of time. Just store it in a double, who cares, move on. Computer's got lots of storage uh, information. It's got a lot of processing power. We don't need to worry about that anymore. So the programmer efficiency becomes more important than computing efficiency. So th this raises an interesting question, Jerry. Why not just have a big bucket? Why, why have all these different data types? Why not just have a, a, a bucket called storage and you can put any <coughs> type of value into that, into that variable? And in fact, uh, a lot of programming languages have uh, JavaScript, for example, has var, uh, which is essentially a gen generic storage location, and you can just put anything in there, numbers, text, whatever. So what's the purpose of having all these different data types to store, um, store data in? Yeah, so again, great question, Paul. And one of the biggest reasons being is that a computer needs to know specifically what the data is that you're assigning it because of the operations you might perform on it. And to give you an example, we can in programming use the plus sign which for most folks we know in mathematical terms allows us to add numbers. So let's say as an example that we just chose a generic storage uh, variable as Paul mentioned and I have a number value stored in one of those variables and I have a textual value stored in another one of those variables. I haven't told the computer what those are. It, as far as the computer knows from, from um, this concept is it's it's just data, so it doesn't matter what it is. But what happens if I want to add that information? If I put that plus symbol between my first variable and my second variable, the computer is going to look at it and go, what do you want me to do with this? I can't add a text or a character to a number. Mathematically, it doesn't make sense. So what am I supposed to do with it? And this is a very important aspect to that that we should talk about from the perspective of how a computer functions as well and that a lot of people go through the process of blaming, you know, oh, I can't get into my banking system, oh, the stupid computer is down, you know, so uh, the stupid computer doesn't know what it's doing, and they're always blaming the computer. But it's very important to remember that, realistically, a computer is not smart. A computer is not able to perform things on its own. The computer has to be told explicitly what to do. So, therefore, if we don't tell it what the data is that we're storing and what type of data that we're storing, it doesn't know how to interact with it or how to act on it based on the operations we might be trying to perform. But another key aspect too is when we're storing the information, when we tell the compiler that we want to store values in a variable, by giving it a type, by giving it a specific data type, we are also telling the computer how much memory to set aside so it knows how much storage we're going to need for this specific program. Remember, going back to um, the concepts of how a computer stores and processes information, it cannot access memory or uh, access program instructions and data directly from a storage device such as a hard drive. It has to load it into memory. This is where the computer knows to tell, or let's say your application has to tell the operating system how much memory it needs in order to load this application in memory. And if we're loading multiple applications in memory, we might not have enough or the computer might have to deal with swapping things out to the hard drive and doing this whole memory swap of information to load one active program in and, and unload an inactive program. So it's very important that the computer knows how much memory it needs to allocate to these data types and what the specific data types are for the interactions it might be doing with it. So, so by using data types, you end up um, improving the performance of your application, and um, it, it also reduces errors. So the computer will know how to treat those data types without having to make a decision, and sometimes those decisions could be wrong. So by using data types, you, you avoid some of those problems. Yeah, exactly, and, and that's a good way of explaining it as well, right? So let's switch back to the slide again here for a second, and we'll cover the remaining ones that we focus on. So that we talked about numeric values there. We, we can also store characters. Um, individual. So if you look at the char value in the left column, which is the second one down, uh, second row down, it will store any Unicode character. And it's important to note Unicode because this represents multiple characters uh, from around the world. And when we talk about, you know, storing information in a computer, we have to represent as many characters as possible so that we can deal with, you know, local languages in our applications as well. But a char is a single character. We can represent it as the letter A. We can represent it as a comma or as an exclamation mark. That's a, that's a char value. That's a single value. 
But what if we want to represent words or phrases or sentences? Well, let's come a little further down that table. The second from the last item is known as a string. And a string really is, is a, it's a string of characters. So it's a string of individual characters, consider it an, an array, if you will, of characters that make up those words, phrases, and sentences. And finally, the last one is a Boolean, which is known as a special data type. Not all programming languages represent it the same. Some will represent it as a true or false. Some will represent it as a zero or a non-zero value. Um, some are very explicit in saying that, no, we represent it as a one and a zero. So uh, again, you know, you'll, as you get into your different programming languages, take a look at the documentation to ensure that they do s support the Boolean in the first place and how they support that. Um, and again, Boolean is just simply it's a true false. That's all, that's all it works out to. So again, you know, very high level, these are variables, constants, data types that you'll work with in your program itself. Um, and, and these are the core pieces that allow you to represent the real world data that you'll need to uh, work with in your program. So now that we've seen how we can represent single individual pieces of information, a character, a number, uh, words and sentences, what have you, we need, now need to talk about how we can store multiple pieces of potentially related information uh, in our system. And this is where we focus on data structures. Now, before we delve too deeply into these, it's important to note that, you know, again, it's, this MVA is designed to kind of help you prepare a little bit for that Microsoft Technology Associate exam on software development fundamentals. Uh, we can't cover everything that you'll need to know what we're going to focus on in the data structures are some of the ones that you will encounter on that exam. The data structures that we'll, we'll cover here are not complete. Uh, different programming languages implement different types of data structures, but we're going to cover kind of the, the core common ones that you'll encounter on the MTA exam, and, and that's why we've chosen these ones specifically. But note that there are more data structures available, uh, and you can still get a, uh, a general understanding of how they work by looking at how these specific data structures function as well. So let's look at our first one. We'll take a look at, um, in this module, arrays, stacks, queues, and dictionaries. So four different ones that we'll focus on, kind of let you know what they look like, how they're implemented, um, where you might use them, and then we'll see some actual code samples of what those look like. So the array is the first one that we're going to take a look at. And you can consider an array to be simply a collection of similar data types which means a collection of data types that we're putting in could be any particular type but one of the aspects about arrays that we need to be aware of is they're designed to store the same data type so we in our array we really are going to typically be storing string values or a collection of number values or as you get into object oriented programming you could store a collection of objects but they typically are the same type um, and arrays are accessed through indexes now, an array is what we might consider to be the ability to, the um, uh, best way of describing it, I guess, is it's a random access data structure. So we can access the values in this array at any time, in any value, in any order, simply by using the index value. So as we look on the slide, we see that in the left-hand column, we have the index values. And in the right-hand column, we actually have some string values representing what we might store in this array. And for simplicity, they're just called item 1, item 2, item 3, what have you. And on the left-hand side is the index that we would use to gain access to those values. Now, the important thing to note is that most programming languages today are zero-based when it comes to arrays. So in other words, they start their counting at zero, not at one. So that's why that little oddity looks kind of out of place, if you will, in this table when you look at it and you see that index zero represents item 1. Well, why wouldn't it represent item 0? Well, realistically, I could have put item zero in there if I wanted to. The reason I did mix this up was because I want you to clearly understand that the index doesn't relate to a numbered value in the right-hand side. It's simply a way of gaining access to the value. If I wanted to pull item three out of there, I would have to use the arrays index two to actually get to that value. So, Jerry, this is a, um, a good time to ask this question, I think. Um, when we talk about data structures, are we really talking about um, just a type of variable? Um, how does this relate to the concepts that you introduced in the previous slide? Yeah, so really good question. And, and that is true, Paul, that the, the data structures will be represented by a variable. The, you, so you have to name them. So when we create an array, and we'll see this in the demo shortly, we have to give it a name so that we, we know where it is. 
Because again, even though it's a, a collection of items, a collection of objects that we're storing, the computer will still store that information directly into the computer's memory. And in order for us to gain access to it, it needs to know where it is. Now, in the, in the uh, case of the array, we will actually store in the array name the pointer or a, a memory address to the beginning of the array. And then the computer knows how to gain access to the rest of it simply by adding whatever our computer memory addresses are in order to get to those individual indexes. But yeah, to answer your question, Paul, absolutely, we're storing these as a variable, a single name, but rather than representing a single piece of data, they're representing multiple pieces of data. Right, so, so, so if you think about the, the relating to the concepts we talked about earlier, a variable could store my first name and just my first name, an array might be able to store all my contact information, so my first name, my last name, my address, and other things. Yep, yep, great clarification point, so cool. So this is, again, very high-level overview of an array. We'll focus a little bit more in, in the demo to kind of give you a visual of what it looks like in the programming code itself, and, and we'll see how we can access the values for it. The next item we want to take a look at is a stack. Now, stacks are kind of interesting because it's not something that you necessarily have to deal with on a regular basis in programming. You, you won't always be creating stacks in your code unless you're doing specific types of programming. And you might consider, uh, if you're somebody who gets the opportunity to work on an operating system, that you will deal with stacks because this is how we store program instruction pointers and data. Well, and we'll talk about that in just a second. but. You know, uh, as we look at the, the visual that I've used here, again, a stack is a collection of objects, but we access it through a couple of different methods called pop and push. And the, the visual or the image that I've used on here is a stack of trays that you might find in a cafeteria. And if you look at this particular structure of trays, you are not able to access the tray at the bottom of that stack. There's no way for you to pull that tray out of the bottom of that stack without obviously damaging the, the structure that's holding it, and we don't want to do that. But it's important to note that in order for you to get to the bottom tray, or in order for you to get to tray number 20 or 26 or 35, you need to remove all the other trays off of the top of that first before you can gain access to it. So when we look at a stack, we can consider when we put values on the stack, programmers say we push a value on the stack. And when we take a value off the stack, we, we pop it off the stack. So it's important to remember that you know, when we put values on the stack, we're putting a value, and then the next value, and the next value, and the next value, and the next value, and our stack continues to grow, pushing the first values down. We can consider a stack to be a data structure that's known in, as a first in, last out data structure. So the first value that goes into the stack is typically the last item that comes off the stack. And I remember uh, when I was working as an instructor teaching some programming classes that I had a student asked me specifically about how do we know uh, in our code when we say we reach a decision structure or a point where we branch off and go do something else in the code, how does the computer know where to come back to when it's finished executing that? So we've, we've got code that's executing sequentially. We hit a point where we branch off and go do something else. We've got to come back to continue that execution. And so I use this analogy to explain to them how the operating systems and the compilers use the stacks to represent that. As the code is executing, we are popping, or sorry, we are pushing um, data and instructions onto that stack, and, and we continue to build that stack. And when we call this other function, when we go off and branch off, we and now push that new instruction on top of it, and then all of the data that we need. And as the, the function executes, it starts popping its instructions and data off, and we keep bubbling back up until we get to the point where that last instruction was. So that's kind of the way stacks are used in a, in a real-world scenario in, in computer programming, just to give you an idea. The next one we look at is a queue. And again, it's a collection of objects, but we access a queue through queuing or enqueuing a value and taking it off through a dequeuing. And I use this one to represent, um, you know, something that would be similar to a line at the motor vehicle branch. This is considered a first in, first out type of a data structure where the, you know, first piece of data that's into the queue will be the first piece of data out of the queue. And you access that information through these different methods that pull the, pull the, um, the items off of the queue. Again, it's very kind of abstract right now when you're looking at it and thinking, well, how does that work? But as we view the samples, the, the way we've written the code samples, you'll actually see how the data values come off of the queue and off of the stack in the specific order that they work. So, you know, if you have questions about that, just kind of hold them for a second. When you see the demo, you'll, you'll get a better understanding of how they work. 
The last data structure that we'll take a look at is the dictionary. And again, it's, it's a collection of objects. And I'm using the term object loosely here because when we get into the object-oriented programming section of this MVA jumpstart, object become, it takes on a different meaning. But for our purposes in this one, think of an object as a character, a string, any kind of a value that we want to store. They're just collections of those values. So it looks similar to that array that we looked at a little bit earlier. The table looks kind of similar. We've got text values on the right-hand side, you know, first item, second item. These could be number values. It could be single characters, whatever we want to store in this. But instead of accessing these values through the use of an index like we did with the array, instead we'll access these through the use of a key. And sometimes, uh, you know, programmers prefer to use a dictionary type of a data structure because it's much easier to know what the data value is that you're pulling out through the use of a key as opposed to the use of an index. Going back to the example you know, that Paul's brought up a couple of times about filling out a form with his first name, last name, you know, all of his contact information, we can store that information into a dictionary and the key would be first name and the data would be Paul and then the key would be last name and the data would be party. So it gives you an idea of how that dictionary um, it, it makes more sense from a logical perspective of how you would pull that information out of the dictionary item itself. All right, enough about me talking. Let's, let's go ahead and take a look at a demo of some of this information and what it is that we will go through in, in uh, figuring out, or I guess demonstrating, if you will, uh, all of the different data structures that we have available. So I've got Visual Studio 2013 up and running here. And we're going to take a look at the different data structures that we just talked about using the values that we had in, in the tables that were displayed. So this instance, the first thing we want to take a look at is our array. Now again, from the perspective of looking at the code here on the screen, don't you know, get yourself too wrapped up into what the individual keywords mean. I'll explain some of them and, and we'll talk about how the, the functionality works a little bit um, on these values, but it's just important for you to just see how these data structures function from a coding perspective. So in the array sample, we've created an array, and here's an example of what Paul talked about where he said, you know, are we using variables for these data structures? Yes, we are. And my array is an example of a variable. And this one, we've told it, will store string values. So that's the data type that we talked about. All right, so we've created a variable to store data types of strings. Again, don't worry about the syntax. These little brackets just simply mean this is an array. This is a, it's a C-sharp syntax that we're using. And we create the new array, and now we're storing values, item one, item two, item three. These are string values that we stored. Again, same as what was represented in the previous slide that we talked about uh, where we had the table for our, our items itself. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to iterate through this array and do a couple of things. And, and the iteration actually comes down here in this little for loop. You know, and, and we'll talk about what that's doing. But this, more importantly, is the access of the array from an index value perspective. That's what this line is going to do for us. Um, this console write line you'll see when we run the code will simply display the values for us on the screen. But what we're going to do is here's the index value of that array. So we're going to pull out the value that's stored at index 2. Right? So we'll show you again how we're accessing it using the index value itself. So let's go ahead and execute this real quick. It will build and then it pops up into a console window on the screen. And you'll notice that the first line here, it says item at index two is item three. And if you're not sure, let's go ahead and take a quick look. Item zero, item one, item two. Remember, arrays are zero based. So index two pulls out item three. And notice that you don't have to assign the index value. Um, as you're adding items to the array, they're just added in the order um, according to when they were put into the array. So zero will be you know, the first item, one will be the second item, and those things. You don't have to actually assign those numbers. Correct, yeah, and it's, it's, uh, that brings up another point too where Paul talks about the, putting the items into an array. Arrays are typically, uh, accept the values in whatever uh, way that you put them in. You can, um, when you create the array, we actually created it, well, item one, item two. So we created the values in a alphabetical order but they might not necessarily always be in an alphabetical order. Uh, a little bit later on, as we start talking about algorithms, you'll see one where we have the ability to sort an array, um, which is something that we might want to do. Because the values put into an array, we might create one dynamically as the code is executing, and the values may not necessarily be in a specific order. And if we want to order that, 
there are different ways that we do for changing the order of the values in there. But again, we, as Paul said, we're not telling it I want to store item one at zero. We're just saying I want to create a new array. Here's the values I want to store in it, and the compiler handles dumping it into the array in the order that we've specified. So it is important to note that because the order was specified here, that's the way the values got put into the array, only because it was the order that we put it, okay? So great point, Paul. Um, now, so the last thing that we did was there was a little for loop. We iterated over all of the items. And just, just again, this is a way of showing you this is what the array contains. So it's a way of outputting it to the screen. And, and that little piece of code that we dealt with was, oh, sorry, was actually in this little for loop here. So this was a repetition structure. We're going to focus on those in, in another module, so don't worry too much about what this does specifically, but it's just iterating over every value in that array and outputting it to the screen. So that's an array. Uh, that's basically how the arrays function. That's how you create an array, uh, specifically in, in C Sharp, and how you can access it through its index value and how you can iterate through and point, push the values out or display them on the screen itself. Now what we're going to do is take a look at an example of a stack. And in this case, we're going to create a stack. Again, here's our variable name called myStack. And we're going to put items into the stack. So if you'll notice, we're using the push method. This is simply a method of the stack object in C Sharp. It's a way of putting the values into our stack. So we're going to push values in, 10 items all together. They're string values. Then we are going to come down and we are going to display the count. So just to verify that we actually have 10 values in this stack. Once we're finished with that, we're going to kind of iterate through another looping structure. And what we're going to do is we're going to say as long as the stack contains values, as long as it, the count of numbers in there is not zero, then we will pop an item off the stack. And it's important to pay attention when we pop an item off the stack as to how they come off. All right, and we'll output some text that says what we're doing and kind of shows you those values. But before I execute the code, notice the order in which I put the values onto the stack. I started with item one and I ended with item 10. Remember, the stack is a first in, last out, right? So what does that mean? Well, let's execute the code and see what happens. Let's go all the way up to the top. The initial count is 10. I popped an item off the stack and here's the key differentiator on that stack. Item 10 came off the stack. If we go back and we look at how I pushed the items on, I pushed item 1 on first and item 10 on last. So that shows you how the stack functions. Item 1 did not come off first. Item 10 came off first because it was the last item we put on the stack. Go back and look at that um, uh, image that we had of the cafeteria trays in that little uh, container and you can consider item 10 as being that top tray. So we've just popped that off and we've lowered our count of the stack to nine because there's only nine values left in it. So that, again, it's important to note that as we retrieve the value from the stack, we're actually taking it off. The array, we didn't. We just looked at the value that was there and said, thank you very much. But here we're actually removing the item with, with the pop. So we continue to count all the way down until we finally removed item number one, which is the first one we put on, is the last one to come off, and our stack count has now gone back to zero. So again, just an example of showing you how a stack actually functions within the programming environment. The, how you interact with it may be different depending on the programming language that you're using, but that's just a generic way that a stack functions. All right, now we'll have a look at our queues. Again, remember that a queue is kind of opposite to the stack in that a queue is a first in, first out scenario. So we're creating a new queue called MyQueue, and we are going to put items into the queue through the use of the enqueue method, and we're, again, putting them in in the same order that we did with the stack, item one, item two, item three. The queue has an interesting uh, feature in C Sharp where we can take a peek at what that first item is. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at what that first item is. We'll take a count just so we can verify that we actually have 10 values in there. And then we're going to dequeue an item. Now you'll notice here I haven't said what item I'm dequeuing. I've just said dequeue. What we're going to do is output to you what that value was that we dequeued, and then we'll show you how the count has been decremented, and then we'll look at what the new first value will be in that queue. Let's go ahead and execute this. 
So again, the first instruction that we executed here was a peak, right? And that told us that the first item is item one. Then we said, give me a count. How many items are in the queue? There's 10. Then I called DQ. Again, I didn't tell it what I wanted to DQ, but because it's a first in, first out, it dropped off item one. So item one comes out. The queue count is now nine. I only have nine items remaining. And I run that peak one more time, and it now tells me that item two is now the first item to come off of my queue. So if I were to run that DQ item again in here, then item two would come off. It would show me item two. My count would decrement again by one. We'd be down to eight. All right, so a little bit of the opposite of how that stack function, where the last object was the first to come off. In this case, the first object was the first to come off. So that's your queue sample. Let's comment that out and then take a look at our last data structure, which is the dictionary sample. And in the dictionary sample, what we're doing is we're creating a new dictionary. Again, here's that variable name, my dictionary. And it's going to store string values. That's simply all that these mean in here. And then we have our keys and we have the values that are be represented by those keys. So we add five items and then we will go ahead and randomly access a value in that dictionary by using the key and then we'll show you how we can actually remove one. So let's go ahead and execute and we can see that it simply says that the item represented by key 3 is known as third item. Right? So again, it's not an index value but it is by using the key so it's a string value. You can see how it might allow you to um, gain a little more insight into what your code is doing because now you have the ability to understand if I'm accessing a value, the key would be a much more um, visual representation, if you will, of what data you're going to pull back as opposed to the array where it only deals with a numeric value, right? All right, so that's our data structure demo. The next thing we want to take a look at is the concept of an algorithm. Algorithms can be mathematical formulas or algorithms can be recipes. Algorithms can be a bunch of different things. You know, consider an algorithm as the solution to a problem. And that's kind of the way, you know, software developers look at an algorithm. It becomes a solution to a problem. And realistically, that's what your product owners come to you with as a software developer. I have a problem. Help me fix it. Help me solve it. You will create an algorithm that is designed to solve that problem. So let's see a couple of examples. One is a real world example and one is kind of a coding example. So if we switch to our slides, we look at an example on the left hand side might be an algorithm that you would focus on for cooking pancakes first thing in the morning for your breakfast. We start off at the opening where it says start pancakes and we're going to add eggs, we're going to add flour, we're going to add water to the mix, then we'll mix it all up and then we look at it and we say, is it the proper consistency? Yes or no? If it's not, we say, well, what's wrong with it? Is it too thick? Yes or no? Well, if it's too thick, then let's add some water. And then that thins it out. We mix it up again. Then we check for the consistency again. And if we're fine, we'll go on and pour it in a pan, serve it and eat it, and we're done. But if we put too much water, well, then we've got to go back and iterate through this again. So you can see how the flow is kind of taking place in this recipe algorithm, if you will, um, in that we go through the process of thinking logically about how we make the pancakes. Without thinking logically, you just get up in the morning, you know, you crack the egg, you throw the flour in, you mix it up, and you go, yeah, it looks good enough, throw it in the pan, you cook it. But this is a logical way of looking at it. This is breaking it down into the discrete aspects. Um, as Paul and I were going over this uh, process, we, we kind of looked at this algorithm for pancakes and realized that there's a bit of a bug in here. And it's important to know that this is why we write things this way. This is why you visualize your algorithms in such a way. And what the subtle bug here was, if you, if you look at the slide again, we see that we had a check to see if it was too thick. And we said if it was, we would add water, and then we would mix, and we would check for proper consistency again. But what if we said, no, it wasn't too thick, right? So in other words, it's too thin. So we said no, and if you follow that no path out, back up, it says, well, let's add flour. But notice what happens next. We immediately add some water again, which that's a bug, okay? So if we did that in, without thinking about it in our morning routine, we would end up in this infinite loop where we would say it's not the proper consistency, it's definitely not too thick, it's too thin, so let's add flour and let's add water and let's just continuously repeat that. So this is why it's important to visualize your algorithms and it helps you pick up these little subtle bugs and, and potential problems that come through. 
Now let's bring that over to a programming perspective. On the right hand side we have something called a algorithm for a bubble sort. Now it's also important to note you might have some of you out there viewing this that go hey I've programmed before and Jerry your bubble sort is not correct. It's not complete, okay? It's not correct, it's not complete. I didn't design it that way because there's a little more complexity in a bubble sorting routine. Um, but it's just to give you an idea of how you might look at it from a programming perspective. You've already seen the arrays, so you know that we have an array of values and, and we've stored them into that, uh, that array collection. And what happens if they're out of order and we want to sort them? What a bubble sort does is it says I need to compare two values and determine if one is less than the other and if they are I need to swap them, right? So I want to put the lower value first and the higher value second. So that's what this bubble sort does is it gets the first value so we say get value one and then we say get value two and then check is two greater than one? Well if it is we're going to swing off to the right and we'll swap one and two and then we come down and we check to see are we at the end of the list or the end of the array. If we are, hey, we're done, sort of. And this is where the, this bubble sort routine is not complete, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But what about the other value, right? So we check to see if 2 is greater than 1. If it's not, well, let's check to see if we're at the end of the list. If we're not at the end of the list, then we need to increment the values. So in other words, we need to continue looping through these values in this array, continuously checking two values, you know, one ahead of the other, one after the other, to see whether one is less than the other, and do this whole swapping routine. But where this is not complete is that a bubble sort routine is probably one of the slowest, most inefficient sorting routines that there are for trying to sort a list of values. And the reason why I say that is consider that we have a, an array of 10 values and we go through the process of iterating through it. What happens if we have numeric values 1 through 10 and number 1, the value 1, is at the very bottom of that array? How many times do we have to iterate over that array before we bubble 1 all the way up to the top? Well, we're going to have to go at least 10 times before we get to number 1, and then we have to swap number 1 for place 9, then swap it from place 9 to 8, then from 8 to... So you can see how this continues to be. We go over this loop numerous times until we get 1 all the way to the top, and then, but then 2 might be the next one down. So we've got to go through that again. So we can, we'll continuously iterate through this loop until we get these values all in a sorted order. So we're going through this loop multiple times, multiple times. 10 values, computer will do it relatively quickly put a million values in it and see how long it's going to take, right? So this is not an efficient sorting routine, right? But again, this is just to give you an idea. This is what an algorithm looks like. This is how you might visualize it before you actually go through the process of writing the code to create that. Now let's take a look at decision structures, our next section in this module. As you saw in those algorithms, we had these little triangular boxes or diamond-shaped boxes what, uh, that ask questions. So your code will always be asking questions. You'll always be looking through your code to say, do I need to do this? Do I need to do that? Is this greater than this? Is this less than that? Is this equal to this? These are all decisions that you will do in your program itself. So the different data or decision structures that we have available for programming, and again, some of these can be uh, programming language specific, but you'll focus on two pretty much common ones, an if decision structure in a switch or select case. Now select case comes from our Visual Basic language, switch comes from our C language, C, C++, C Sharp, Java, they all use the switch and they will use the if and the if else if. These decision structures allow us to evaluate a condition, take a look at whether it's true or false, and then take an action based on that and, and that's essentially what they do. They allow us to change the flow of our code so we can implement branching in our code to go where we need to. Um, in the days of the VIC-20, the days of basic, you know, beginner's all-purpose symbolic instruction code programming language, we used things such as GoTo and GoSub, and everybody didn't like them because they created things called spaghetti code. It was very difficult to keep track of where you were at. Um, so instead, we make use of functions now, which are discrete pieces of, um, you know, functionality that our code uses. And we can change our program flow based on what the outcome of these decision structures are. So, without too much conversation on that, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, an example of some decision structures. If I can find the, I know I have it here somewhere, there we go, there's our decision demo. Um, it's much easier to uh, kind of understand how these decision structures flow if we look at them from the coding perspective. So here we're going to take a look at the if decision structure at first, and it comes in different forms and, and we'll focus on each one. These variables that we've created up here just allow us to 
check these conditions as we go through the, through the code flow itself. So our first sample is a quick and simple if one. We set up a condition variable and we assign it the value one. And then in our if condition, we have the keyword if, and in the parentheses we have a condition or a, um, uh, a, an evaluation, if you will, for lack of a better term. We need to evaluate what the value of condition is currently set to. And we do it through this syntax of condition one equals one. And we're gonna take a look at if it's equal to one, what do we do? So the way an if, stru uh, an if structure works is that it will execute code, in our case, this line of code, if this evaluates to a true condition. If it doesn't, this code won't execute. But regardless, this line of code is going to execute. All right. So it makes sense to see it in action. Let's go ahead and execute that real quick. And we can see that we output comparison evaluated to true and we said that this line executes after the if regardless of the condition. What does that mean? Well, we set condition to one and we checked here if it, to see if it was equal to one and because it was, this line of code executed. Regardless, this line was going to execute anyway. And to show you how that works, let me go ahead and change this value to two, execute the code again and notice that that line in the middle didn't execute this time. The line in, in the curly braces didn't, but the last line did. So again, regardless of the condition, that was outside of the control of that decision structure and it executed anyway. Now, if you're curious about why I'm using a single equal statement here and a double equal statement here, this all deals with, again, very syntax specific from the code itself. In C Sharp, a single equal symbol is considered to be an assignment. We are assigning the value to to this variable whereas a double equal sign represents a comparison operator. Is this equal to or not? All right. So a simple if statement. Let's go ahead and comment that out because we want to look at the next one, which is an if else sample. This is something that you would use if you're trying to determine whether a condition is true or if it's false and to take action based on whichever one it is, right? So in this case, we're going to set the condition one equal to three. And we're going to, again, do the comparison to see if it's equal to one. And if it is, we'll execute this statement. But now we've got an else clause in here that says, you know what? I want to do something if that evaluates defaults, rather than just the standard, you know, continue execution from that point forward. If we execute this, you'll know that it says comparison evaluated defaults. And it did that, so in other words, it executed this else clause because three and one are not the same. If I change that to one and execute it, then only the first one executes. It says comparison evaluated to true. Right? So the if else structure is a way of saying, if the condition is true, I want you to do this, but if it's not true, I want you to do this. Whereas the, if, the simple if that we demonstrated the first time said, if the condition is true, do this and I'm done. I don't care what you do after that, but I just, I'm worried about if this condition is true, I want you to do this. In this case, we're saying if the condition is true, do A. If it's not true, do B. Is there any way in that algorithm that you just wrote to um, cause neither line to execute the way that that's written? Ah, so that, that's an interesting question. If, if neither line was true, would what would happen, right? And in this case, no, because the way that this specific if structure is written is it will only execute something based on either true or false okay and if it's true this first one executes if it's not the else clause executes and then everything beyond that will execute regardless so it, kind of going in, in a sense from your question it if we go back to the first if statement where the line executed regardless of the if condition anything that's beyond this will execute so if, if we didn't have a true or a false value we wouldn't really execute, right? So, right, so but, from, but the way that that algorithm is written, that one of those lines will execute. One will execute, right? Because that's the way the if structure works is it's based on Boolean algebra, right. um, essentially. So there either has to be a true or a false. That's right. I don't want to get into discussing nulls because that's a more that's advanced right. topic, but there is something called a null, which is kind of the absence of something. Um, but, it, and that would more fit into the answer to that question. But in this instance, one of these will execute. Okay, because it's either true or false. Right. 
Now we get into a little more complex one, which is an if, else if, else clause. And what this one says is, I might have one condition, or I might have a second condition, or I might have not, neither one of those conditions. So this might come back a little bit to what you were talking about in, in that first one where we say, all right, I've got a con two variables, condition one and condition two, and I want to check to see if condition one is equal to one, and if so, I'll execute this. But if it's not true, then let me check to see, oh, maybe condition two is true. Then I'll execute this one. But if neither of them is true, then I'll execute this one, right? So, you know, we might relate that to a real-world scenario where I walk into a car dealership and I want to buy a Corvette Stingray, but I don't have enough money for a Corvette Stingray. And I don't have enough money for a Corvette Stingray. Mm -hmm. I'd love to have one, but unfortunately I can't buy one. So my first condition evaluates to fault, so I won't buy the Corvette Stingray. But my next else if might be, but what if I have enough money for a Camaro? And I do, so I'll buy the Camaro, right? But it might be, no, I don't have enough money for the Stingray. I don't have enough money for the Camaro, so I'm going to buy the Aveo, right? So that's kind of give you an example of how this will function. Let's go ahead and take a look at what it does in code. So condition one, we've set to one. Condition two, we've set to two. Before I execute it, very quickly think which statement is going to execute. And time's up because we're running it. So condition one is true. And you'll notice that none of the other statements execute it, right? So it's kind of a, what we refer to sometimes as a short circuiting. If the first condition evaluates to true, I don't need to check anything else. So the code just, it said, I'm done. Condition one is true. I execute that line of statement. Forget about the rest of the if statement. I'm done, right? So the rest of these are not even evaluated anymore, realistically, okay? So let's go ahead and say, oh, no, condition number one is not true. So I've changed it to three. We execute it again. Now because condition one was not equal to one, we didn't, we didn't print out that statement, but we then we said, okay, well, if it's not true, let me look at the second one, see if it's true. And it was, so we printed out the second one. And let's make one more change and make this not true or false. And you'll notice that neither condition is true. So that's how the if, else, if, else actually functions. And you can string those uh, on indefinitely, correct? You can have else if, else if, else if. You can nest those until you are so tired of nesting that you just don't know where to go anymore. And unfortunately, that's not something you want to that's get correct. into. And because these if structures can be nested so deeply, you can actually get lost in an if structure that you've got nested or multiple else ifs, else if, else. And it just creates this long string of code that you don't want to get into. As a result, we actually have... Um, Paul is great at segueing into the next topic. So we have this structure called switch. And, and what the switch does, it gives you a, a cleaner way of checking multiple conditions and executing code based on that. So we set up something called a switch condition variable in, in which we're going to check a value. And the switch has a very specific structure in that we, we do the conditional check at first. So we have the switch statement opening and we have our condition that we look at here and we're going to compare it to something and what we compare it to, or that something, is what's written in these case statements. All right, so these are the values that we will compare the switch condition. So consider this a little bit similar to saying, you know, like we see here we say if condition one equals one, this is exactly what this is doing. Case one says if condition one is equal to this value here, I want you to execute these lines of code. Okay. So we've got switch condition set to three. Let's see what happens when we execute this. You should be able to figure out which one's going to print. So we print out value is three, all right? And the reason that we did that was because, well, switch condition was set to three, and case three was where it evaluated to true, and we stepped into it, okay? Don't worry too much about, you know, the, again, the, the whole syntax of this. As you start learning the program and getting used to the switch statements, you'll, you'll understand how these values function, uh, what these different pieces are. But just know that this break statement is kind of important here because this is the way for you to say, if, you know, if this statement is true, execute this line of code and then break out of there. So, so get out of this loop or this decision structure. We're done. Don't execute anything beyond that. All right. There are other ways that you can check multiple conditions with switch statements, but again, that gets into more complexity. 
Um, but the last one that I did want to bring up is this thing called default. This is optional. You can include it or not include it. And this is kind of, in a way, it goes back to what you know, Paul alluded to a little bit earlier. So is there a way of writing it so that you know, if none of those conditions are true, something happens? And that's exactly what this one is, is designed to do. So we've set up a switch condition um, variable, and we've assigned it 5. And you'll notice that we don't have a 5 in any of our case statements here. We only have a 1, 2, or 3. So if I execute this case statement, it says the value is 5. So in other words, it said, well, none of these matched. So this is my default. This is what I will do if it doesn't happen. OK, make sense? Perfect. So that is our little um, discussion on decision structures. Now we have to focus on repetition. Repetition is where we get into programs generating something that repeats or loops. And repetition is something that you'll run into in, in programming a lot because it's something that is uh, usually required to uh, complete functionality in your algorithm. And, you know, we, talked, we, we showed you the bubble sort. That's an example of something that will be done on a repetitive basis. We need to do a comparison and we need to swap if something matches a certain value and we need to go back and we need to repeat that again. And so repetition is very important in programming. We have different uh, repetitive structures in programming that allow us to uh, create the different loops that we want to do, so, so the different functionality. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at what we'll cover here are things such as for loops, while loops, do while loops, and my all-time favorite, it's not really because it drove me crazy when I was learning programming, recursion, um, which is something that you will potentially encounter. Some programmers say you don't have to deal with it. Some say you do. It's a great way of working with stuff. But we'll take a look at recursion. Um, so what we're going to focus on is the, the different type of loops that we have, why you would choose one over another, and, and basically how they function themselves. So again, we're not going to talk to this one. We're going to demo so you can see visually how these things function. So let me go ahead and find my looping structure, um, sample code, and... I've got way too many projects open here. So that was my class demo. This is errors. And this is looping, which is the one that we want to focus on. So we're going to step into our first looping structure we said was a for loop. And a for loop basically is a structure that says, I want to do something repeatedly until a condition evaluates the faults. Right? So as long as a condition is true, I want to continue in this, in this loop. And the thing that's kind of interesting is, is the for keyword is basically a way of saying, for each value in this range of whatever I'm working with, I want you to do something, okay? As long as something remains true. And each one of our loops, as, as we take a look at going through these looping structures, it's important to note that we should create something known as a sentinel value. And a sentinel value is something that we focus on um, in the loop that allows us to terminate it. And I remember as I was, again, learning my programming uh, many years ago, there was a quote that I remembered uh, reading from one specific author in a book that I was going through. And he said, we can create infinite loops. And infinite loops are loops that never end. And in terms of the programming world, an infinite loop is funny when it happens to another programmer, but not to you. But having said that, there are purposes for infinite loops. And in other words, it's, you want to put the computer into a, a uh, situation where it's continuously looping until something happens. Um, a great real-world example might be consider a, 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 a game controller input. If you're playing on your Xbox console and you know, you're, you're moving your character around through the screen, there's actually a routine in the program that kind of runs, it's, it's what we refer to as a polling routine. And it's a loop that runs continuously looking for the input from those controllers, so from the control inputs. And based on you know, what you're doing, then it goes through the process of moving your character around the screen based on those inputs. Or maybe you, know, you squeeze a trigger to, to shoot something if you're playing a first-person shooter, or if you're in a racing game and you, you, know, you, you pull on the trigger and it accelerates the car. That's an example of, of a loop that is running continuously, but I wouldn't necessarily call it infinite because it does have an ending point which is when we shut down the application, right? So 
uh, you know, numerous times new programmers will run into this. They'll forget to, to do something with her, their Sentinel value in the loop. And the loop runs continuously, and all of a sudden they get an out-of-memory error on their program because we've just filled up the stack in the computer, and we've halted the computer because we've taken up too much. So let's go back to our code quickly, and we'll take a look at how the, or, or the structure of the for loop itself. Now, you'll notice we've got the keyword for, but then we also have some bits and pieces inside the parentheses. We have a counter, and an, this is what's known as the initialization, initialization portion of the for structure. So we declare a variable type, a data type of integer. We create the variable name called for counter, and we assign it the value 0. Always a good idea to initialize your variables in your code. Most compilers today will complain when you don't do that. They'll come up and tell you, hey, your use of an uninitialized variable. Um, in earlier compilers, they didn't give you that uh, warning, and so the chances are the computer would assign a memory location to that variable, but there could have been data stored in that from a previously executed program, and the data that got pulled into your code was not what you intended. So that was bugs in the program code, and it caused programs to crash. All right, so we initialize. Then what we do is we have a condition. Let's go ahead and check to see if the for counter, or our loop counter in this case, is less than 10. And if it evaluates to true, we're going to execute this statement in our code, and you'll see that momentarily. The last piece is what we call the increment portion. And this one is kind of interesting because in a for loop, we actually execute the initialization and the comparison, but we don't do anything with this section just yet. We execute, if we were still in true, by the way, we execute this portion of the looping structure. And then when it's finished, this is increment portion takes place. This little plus plus at the end is the same as saying four counter equals four counter plus one. We're adding, we're adding one. We're incrementing it by a single value. This is our, this controls our sentinel value. Once we increase it to the value 10, this will evaluate defaults and our loop will stop, right? Enough talk. Let's see what that looks like. All right, for loop. So we printed out at the top. This is a for loop. And all we're doing is we're simply outputting the value of that loop counter. Right? So it's at 0, it's at 1, it's at 2, it's at 3. Oh, wait, we stopped at 9. But didn't we say 10 was in here? Again, it's very important to keep in mind how these comparison work, uh, operators work, how uh, the, the counter starts at zero instead of counting at one. But in this case, we're simply saying as long as this counter value is less than 10, execute this. But as soon as it reaches 10, we stop. So that's why we didn't output 10. We only saw nine as the last value that was output. Right? So again, very quick and simple. That is, that is a for loop sample. That's how we do the looping with that type of a structure. We also said that we had a while loop. Well, what the heck is a while loop? Well, this is what the code looks like. So, again, these are just statements we're going to output on the screen itself. In this case, a while loop is a little bit simpler looking than the for loop itself. So we have the keyword while, and in parentheses we have our condition, where we say while the counter, in this case we've called the variable while counter, while it's less than 5, I want you to execute these statements in the curly braces. Now, if you're wondering where the while counter comes from, again, we've declared these variables up here, okay? So, while it's less than 5 and it's starting off at 0, I want you to execute this. But notice also that, unlike the for loop, we don't have an increment portion here. We also don't have that initialization portion. So, we have to create the variable outside of that. So, it has to be created ahead of time. We do the conditional check. And because we want our loop to end, we'd better do something with that sentinel value. So inside the while loop, we have to do the increment portion as opposed to the for loop where it took care of it in the parentheses up here. Right? So this is very relatively simple on the while loop. So as long as the counter is less than 5, let's go ahead and execute. And again, you'll notice we stop at 4 because once that condition evaluates to a false condition, that loop no longer executes. All right? So we've stopped it on the while loop. Now, here's one that is going to kind of mess with your mind just a wee little bit if you're not experienced do while loop. And we'll mess with your mind even more in the recursion example. But this one will, will kind of start you on the path of wondering, what am I getting into? Um, so a do while sample is similar to a while loop 
and it's similar to a for loop with one exception. The while loop will only execute as will the for loop if our variable evaluates to true. Now, the do loop is different because we don't do that check until the end of the loop itself. So what does that mean specifically? Let's, let's just go ahead and execute this for a second and see what it does. Looks exactly the same as the while loop. We spit out 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and we stop. So theoretically, there's no difference between that while loop and that do while loop. But in practice, there is a difference. And here's the reason why. Because we don't do the conditional check until the end of the loop, the do loop behaves a little bit differently. So we're teching, I'm sorry for scrolling back and forth, I'm not trying to drive you crazy with this, but our value here is checking for a value less than five. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set my variable equal to six, okay? So that means that theoretically this shouldn't execute because my condition should evaluate defaults, or does it? So the do counter is at 6. Why did that print out, right? Why did we get something printed out there instead of not doing it at all? And again, the reason being is because the condition is not tested until the end. So the do loop essentially says, do this, and then check this, and if it evaluates, we'll stop. Mm -hmm. right. so, so that's the difference between the while loop and the do loop. And, and you have to be, or the do while, if you will, you have to be careful about you know, your considerations for doing that. But you know, why would you use a do loop versus a, a do while versus a while loop? Well, maybe you want to output something to the screen or you want something to take place regardless of what that condition will be. So maybe we want to let somebody know we're in a routine and we'll, we'll check something later. So we need to output a value or we need to do something regardless of what that condition is and then we check to see if that condition has changed. So there's, there's a couple of different ways of, of looking at it from that perspective, right? All right, last uh, sample that we'll take a look at here to end out this session is recursion. And again, as I said, we will really mess with your mind on this one. I know that if, if I don't program these often enough myself and I come back and I take a look at them, I really have to go and spend some time thinking about what what this recursive function is actually doing because it does it's it when you you can overthink these very easily you can overthink these and and uh, all teachings that I've ever had on recursion says don't overthink it just focus on the core of what it is let let the computer worry about the repetition aspect of it okay so again we're just going to output some values to the screen here but then we set up a variable called value and we're going to store a data type of long inside this value. But here's something that you haven't seen yet, and, and this is what's known as a function call. So we're going to actually call something, which is this function called factorial. And we're going to pass it in a value of 10, and we're going to basically let it do its thing. And then we're going to end up seeing what the value is that resulted from that function. So if you're familiar with mathematical concepts, you'll probably understand what factorial is. If you're not familiar with mathematical concepts, let me briefly explain what factorial is. A factorial is a way of saying, I'm going to take a range of values, you tell me the upper limit, and I will tell you what all of those values are multiplied together. That's essentially what factorial works out to be. And so let's go ahead and look at the code and we'll see what that specifically um, means as we execute this. And I'll execute it quickly, you'll see the value, and then we'll, I'll, I'll kind of do a little step through it. It might take a little, bit of a, uh, a little bit of time here for you to step through it, but it really helps you understand it. Um, again, remember how we talked about computers are very good at doing this and very fast, so we've got our value back, 3,628,800. You're probably looking at it and thinking, what does that mean to me? How did you get that value? How, how does that make sense? We're going to talk about debugging a little bit later on, but this is kind of a, a, a neat function within most uh, integrated development environments, and, and I love the way Visual Studio does this. It allows us to step through our code one line at a time to see what's taking place. So let's go ahead and, and run this code again. But this time, you, you saw that our little console window dropped away real fast because what it did was 
it came back and it stopped on the code and it said, oh, you put a breakpoint here, so we'll execute the code until we get to this point and then I'll stop because what I want to do is show how this is actually uh, going through the process of functioning. So this line of code executed up here, this, this long value equals factorial with 10 and it basically said, I want you to you know, go out and call this value and we're passing in this thing called n and if I hover my mouse over, you see it's the value 10 that we passed in from that function call. And so I can step into this one line at a time, right? So you can see this step into. My code will start to execute one individual line at a time. Now, here's the important uh, thing that, that I was always taught, you know, the, the, the instructors when I was going through recursion were telling me, just, just focus on the simple thing. And the thing to focus on is this little piece. If the value passed in is equal to zero, we are done and we return one. And that's a way of saying our we're finished. We're, we're finished this recursive execution. This is the piece that gets complex. If you're trying to sit here and put this in your mind and hash it out, you know, mentally in, inside your head, and, and yeah, I know there are folks out there that can do it, um, but you're probably a lot smarter than me if you can figure it out in your head. I try not to. I let the computer deal with it. But, but this is the complex part because it's, it's like looking in a mirror that's looking in a mirror if you will. So it, you're, you're going to do something repeatedly. But again, we have this whole sentinel value that kind of breaks us out of that. So let's step into it. We know that the value n is 10. Let's kind of execute this. Oh, so you see what happened is that we did a comparison. We said if n is equal to 0, we want to return. But because it evaluated defaults, we skipped this, right? And we come back here now and we say, I want to return. And this is just a keyword that says, I had somebody call me, call this function, I have to send a value back to that caller, right? It would be the same as, uh, you know, me saying, you know, here's a $20 bill, I want you to run down to the store for me and bring back a jug of milk. That's, that's kind of what a, a function and a return is all about. We're kind of doing that same thing here. Um, in this case, we're going to return 10 jugs of milk, if you will, um, you know, but we're doing something differently with it. So we say I want to return that value multiplied by, but not a specific value, Darn it, we're multiplying it by calling this function again. So in the way code functions, the way that the compiler evaluates this is it says, I can multiply n by this, but I don't know what this is yet. So I have to go call that to get the value before I can multiply it to n. And by the way, while I do it, I'll decrement n by 1. So I'll subtract n by 1 because we have to end this thing. That's our sentinel value. We've got to get back to zero. So we'll do that decrementing portion. So what happens is, let's, let's go ahead and step through this again. So notice that it said return n times factorial. And because it did that, it called itself. That's recursion. It's calling itself. So it said, I want to multiply, or I want to call factorial, and I want to, to pass in n minus 1. Because n was 10, now n becomes 9. Right, so watch down here in this window, and you'll see that value change right, as we, as we start stepping through this. So it's not equal to zero. We step over that, and we recursively call ourselves again. Now n has decremented to 8, and then 7, and then 6, and then 5. Right? So let's very well step through this till we get back to the point where now n is 0. So we say I want to return 1. We step outside of our function. Oh, wait a minute now. How come that didn't go back to here, where we're going to assign the value back? Well, it doesn't do that because I'll take you back to our concept of a stack. Remember how we said we're pushing values onto a stack, we're popping values off the stack? This is what recursion is doing here. Is recursion is taking, every time we call that recursive function, we're taking that previous value and we're pushing it onto the stack. And then we're saying, I can't get at that yet because I'm calling recursive and I'm pushing another value on top and I'm pushing another value on top and pushing another value. When we get to the point where this n is now equal to zero, now we're going to start popping those values off the stack. And while we're popping the values off the stack, that's where the mathematical uh, process takes place. That's where we start doing the multiplication. So back to our code quickly, and we'll see that the value of n will start to change. It's now counting up because we're popping these values off the stack and we're actually executing that value of n minus 1 and we're doing this multiplication now. So this is where we're multiplying those values over and over again, right? So we're doing 5 and then 6 and 7, 8, 9, 
and now we've finished because we can now pop, we've popped all the values off the stack. We can now pass it back to the calling function, and when we continue to execute that portion of code, we write out the value to our screen, in which case our console window, well, it normally pops up, but when we're in debug, it kind of messes it up a little bit. Sorry, uh, back to our, um, I lost track of which one I was in, web demo class, errors, there it is, sorry, looping demo, okay. So as we, if we were to continue that execution, then the, the window would pop up. Because we were running it in a different mode, the window disappeared really fast, but you saw in the earlier version, you know, when we didn't have the code on there, we got 363,682,800. If you think I'm pulling your leg, if you think that's not quite exactly what would happen, let me uh, go ahead and run the Windows calculator. And let me go ahead and put in the values 10. Now, I'll do this on the numeric keyboard so you won't see me clicking the different mouse on here. But if we go 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times, oops, my mistake, I did 6 twice. 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, we get the same value. So that's a long way around doing a simple calculation like this, but that's what recursion does. That's that factorial method. And the recursive function basically said, I want to call myself however many times you tell me to. I push all those values in the stack because I need to multiply them later. And then when I'm done, I basically do the multiplication. And because it was on the stack, and I showed you the, the calculation doing the calculator of 10 times 9 times 8 because that's the way the computer does it. It's popping 10, then 9, then 8 off the stack. So that's essentially what the recursive value did. All right. So that is our demonstration on repetition. And I believe we have completed this module. So this is your, uh, you know, again, to take a look at what it is that we've, we've focused on in here. We covered some core fundamental knowledge that you need to understand as a programmer. We looked at what the uh, data types are that you'll use in the computer programming. We talked about how the computer stores and processes information. We demonstrated the decision structures and the looping structures that you'll run across in your codes. And just to kind of give you a really good core grounding in some of the key concepts that you'll focus on in uh, your computer programming career. So hopefully you enjoyed that. Hopefully you got something out of it. Um, and be sure to come back for Module 3, where we'll start talking about object-oriented programming. Hi and welcome to the Microsoft Virtual Academy session on Software Development Fundamentals. My name is Jerry O'Brien, a technical CDM here at Microsoft, and my co-presenter today is Mr. Paul Party. Hi, I'm Paul. I'm a content development lead at Microsoft. What we're going to start covering in this module is module number three, and we're going to focus on object-oriented programming. In today's world of software development, object-oriented programming is pretty much what most developers are doing helping us to model real-world objects in our software applications. So it's a, uh, it's a really important concept for you to grasp, and it, it's a rather deep subject, so we can focus on a lot of, uh, a lot of concepts in, in object-oriented programming. This session, you know, we've, we've got about 50 minutes to give you a general overview of what it is, so we won't delve too deeply, but we will cover some very specific aspects of it, and that we'll take a look at the fundamentals of classes, We'll kind of dis, you know, describe a little bit about what a class is, how you create one in code. We'll talk about what the term encapsulation means in terms of object-oriented programming. We'll give you a, an introduction to inheritance and, and why that's important for uh, object-oriented programming. And then we'll talk a little bit about polymorphism. And we'll demonstrate these uh, through the use of code to give you an idea of how they all fit within the object-oriented programming world. Um, we won't spend a lot of time about you know, design considerations for your classes because, again, we can go quite easily spend an entire five days of a classroom-based training focusing on object-oriented principles. Um, here this is designed to prepare you for the MTA exam. Uh, we have a Microsoft Technology Associate Exam 98-361. 
that focuses on the conceptual um, components of software development fundamentals. And so this is what we'll cover is, is at a conceptual level and giving you some concrete examples within the code itself. Jerry, what is um, object-oriented program programming contrast with? What other types of programming models are there? So we have other different kinds of programming models. Uh, in the past, we used to, to program in what was considered either structured programming, uh, which was the term it was commonly referred to as, and, and structured programming is more along the lines of writing code that is very specifically structured, um, divided up in discrete pieces of functionality, such as a method that does this and another method that does something else, and our code would call those specific methods to do all of the um, um, processing that the application required. And in trying to create applications that model real-world scenarios, uh, structured programming was a little more difficult to, to implement because there wasn't a way of representing the objects in your code that you were working with. And prior to that, we were even doing just re really basically top-down sequential uh, programming where we code started at the top of the, of the window in, in the, the first code instruction and executed step down all the way through to the end. So object-oriented programming is a, is a paradigm or it's a model that allows us to to get more close to um, creating the attributes and the behaviors of the items that we want to uh, function within our code itself. So that's essentially the difference between the other programming models. All right. So let's have a look at the fundamentals of classes. This will be the first section uh, that we'll take a look at here. And fundamentals of classes allow us to focus on what a class is, uh, how we potentially use them in our code and within our programs. And, um, and then you know, we'll see a demo on how to create them as well. But the fundamental aspects give us an idea of how we apply the real world aspects of an object into, a, into the coding environment itself. So we can consider a class in our program sort of like a blueprint, if you will. Or uh, you know, we call, I call them a blueprint. It could be a blueprint for a house. It could be a blueprint for an automobile or, or a part that we're going to manufacture. And if you consider looking at it from the perspective of calling a class a blueprint, it's the same as saying, if we want to build a house, we're going to have an architect draw up a blueprint. And the blueprint has very specific information about what that house is going to look like. The number of windows, the size of the house, how it's going to be constructed, you know, what it'll basically look like. Uh, again, taking a look at maybe a blueprint for a car, it would determine what the car model would look like specifically. So it could be the color of the car, how many wheels it's going to have, how many doors it will have, you know, where the windows are going to position. But also more importantly is it also tells us from a different perspective of what kind of behaviors, if you will, that that car is going to have. So the car can accelerate, it can brake, it can steer. Those are important aspects um, of the car itself. So when we talk about a class as a blueprint, that's what we're referring to in that we're creating the blueprint or the mapping of what this object is going to look like in code. Now, it's also important to note that we have a term called objects, and when we create objects, those are a representation of that class in code. The difference between the two is, the, you know, the reason I mentioned classes like a blueprint, you cannot live in the concept of the blueprint of a house, but you can live in the house itself, and the house becomes an instance created from that blueprint. So the class is the blueprint, you can't live in the class, but the object is an instance of that blueprint or an instance of that house and you can live in that house. You know, using the car analogy as well, the design or the blueprint for the car, you can't drive that, but you can drive an instance of that car. So that's, that's the subtle difference between a class and an object. And you'll see, you know, uh, you'll, you'll use those concepts as you start creating classes and instantiating or creating objects of those in your code. The important thing to note about too is when we create a class file is it includes all of the data or what we refer to as the attributes and it includes all of the behaviors of that specific class or that object in our code itself. So the data becomes the defining characteristics and I talked about in the car the color of the car, how many doors it has, how many windows and what size the windows are. Those are data or attributes of the class itself. And the behaviors are more about what that object is capable of doing. Um, you know, on, uh, let's switch to our slide here and we can see an example of a class that we've called animal. And the attributes are the type, the weight, and the color. And we'll represent this in code in the demo shortly, but that is considered the data or the attribute of that particular animal class. It has a type, it has a weight, it has a color, and I'm sure you could come up with, you know, a, a number of other types of attributes that you want to associate with a particular animal. But then we have a couple of other items on here called make noise and move. Those are examples of the behavior 
of the animal class. So animals can make a noise. You know, a cat's going to meow, a dog's going to bark. Uh, consider humans as animals if you want to, and we talk. So that's a way of making noise. That's a behavior that we have. And also move. So animals, you know, are not typically going to stand in one spot, so they have the ability to move. Once again, you can probably come up with a lot of other behavior patterns that an animal could do, you know, like eating, for example, if you will, um, you know, and, and other things that you want to add to it. We're just going to try to keep it simple from this perspective just to allow you to gain, you know, uh, a good understanding of what a class and an object is through simple implementations. So. Uh, if I can interrupt, uh, Jerry, would it be correct to say that um, for those viewers who watched the previous module, module uh, two, was it module two? Yeah. Yes. Uh, where we talked about variables, constants, and algorithms, would it be correct to say that a, that a class is just a collection of variables, constants, and algorithms? It's just, just essentially it wraps those up so that you can reproduce those, um, duplicate them, and then use them over and over again. Yeah, exactly. So if you take a look at it from that perspective, when we create the class, the attributes or the data that we'll store in the class will be represented through variables and through constants. And we could create data structures within it uh, to, to represent, you know, collections of pieces of data that will, will uh, actually be represented as well. Um, in the, the previous modules, as we talked about demonstrating our uh, repetition structure, which was a good example, where we demonstrated recursion, we actually called a method, and, and that method is an example of the behavior. We would implement that in code to say what we wanted that object to do. Um, and, and another way of looking at it, too, is, is to think about, uh, most people are familiar with automated teller machines, so banking machines when you go to make a deposit. There are certain behaviors that that banking machine has that you would expect of it. You would expect it to you know, allow you to log in allow you to make a deposit, allow you to make a withdrawal, transfer between accounts, or even to check your balance. That's an example of behaviors, and those would be, that's functionality you would have to write in your code to make that work within that class itself. So again, it's very important to, to think about, um, you know, the fundamentals of class as being data and behavior all in one, which brings us to the next point. So we flip over to our slide, we can see that Creating that data and behavior as a part of the class is something known as encapsulation. Um, but encapsulation in object-oriented programming terms is a little bit more than that as well because not only do we include the data and the behavior, but it gives us, by using the encapsulation theory and concepts, we can actually hide data from the user. And in this case, the user is not the person using your program, although it could be, but it's more the user becomes yourself or another programmer who's using that class or that object in code. We, we create something that's known as a black box, and, and the black box is a term that comes from, you know, the, the days of, of people creating their little home projects in electronics, um, in which case, you know, you go to your local radio shack and you pick up a, a printed circuit board and you pick up a bunch of little electronic components. You bring them home and you assemble them all together to make something. Uh, one of the first projects I did way back in high school was uh, an automatic headlight reminder and what it was designed to do is you'd hook it up in your car and if you turn the ignition off and forgot to turn the headlights off it made a beeping sound so it was kind of neat it was this little you know project that I created but in order to put it in a container you would also buy you know a, a, an actual little black box that is what your container what your components actually sat into and the the concept of black box basically means that users can take your automatic headlight reminder and they can use it without knowing how it does what it does inside. That's kind of the concept of a black box. It's just, you know, it, look at the, the, the stereo in your car. You get into your car and, you know, you, you turn the thing on and you adjust the volume by rotating the knob and you can, you know, hit your favorites button and program in all of your different stations. You don't have a clue what's taking place in that radio behind the scenes and you don't have to know. It's, you're interacting with it through these components, which are known as the interface. And so encapsulation allows us to create this functionality but yet hide it so that other people don't really need to see what it is that it's doing, which means they can't manipulate what it's doing, but it also means that they don't take and try to guess at, if I call this method to do X in that class, you know, is there something that I need to know about that method? Well, no, it's not. The, 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 um, the interface or, or the, their accessibility to this class simply says, I have this method called move, and you don't need to do anything, but just call it, and, and I'll take care of everything behind the scenes. So that's an important aspect of encapsulation is that a lot of that is, is actually hidden. The other thing that we uh, focus on from that encapsulation perspective is it allows us to, when we talk about you know, the behavior and the data hidden from the user, we can control what they do with that data. So 
we, uh, in the demo, we'll see that we've got a few variables for this animal class that we declare as private, so we hide them from the user, meaning that they can't set the values in those directly. They have to use our programming interface to set the values and retrieve the values, and it gives us much better control over the data that users pass in and the data that they get back in on their system. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, what a simple class looks like in code. We'll switch over here to Visual Studio. And what we've done here is actually modeled that animal class that we had on the slide, and we've written it in code. So we have the name animal as the name of the class. And we have things known as member variables. Again, we talked about the data or the attributes. That's precisely what these are. So we've implemented color, a weight, and a type. We've implemented data types. So as Paul alluded to a little bit earlier, you know, are we storing these variables? And yes, we are. So it's, it's the, the class is encapsulating that data, and we're doing so by creating data types or the variable data types within it. So we have a couple of string values, and we have a numeric value that's, that's double. Notice these keywords, private. And this is where I talked a little bit about that encapsulation. We're making these private, which means that if somebody were to use my animal class in code, they would not be able to set the value for color, weight, or type directly by simply saying, I want to change the value for type. Instead, what they do is they use something called a property. And this is our interface, if you will, for setting and getting these specific private member variables. Notice that it's, it's kind of a code convention. It's not required. It's just the way that we do this. But my first type is, or first data attribute is known as type. Notice it has a lowercase. Some folks prefer to use a, a, an underscore, so they might prefix that with an underscore. Again, it's just a, it's a coding choice. It's a it's syntax for the code itself. But the property to access it starts with an uppercase T. And again, it's not required. You, we can call this property whatever we want to call it. But it makes it easier for you to read. It's code readability when you do things like this. If you see the uppercase um, T, you know that it's a property. If you see the lowercase T in the code, you know that it's the actual data variable that we're storing. Within each of the properties, we have something called a getter and a setter. So the get keyword means I want to retrieve the value, and the return statement simply sends that back. Notice it's sending back the lowercase T, which means it's sending back the value from here. The setter using the keyword set, takes a generic value coming in. And, and the keyword value is something that C-sharp uses um, in its property methods that says this is the value that somebody has passed in to set what the type is. And so we assign to the lowercase type, so the member variable type here, whatever the user has passed in. And isn't it true, Jerry, that the property actually doesn't store any data? It's the variable that stores the data, and the property is the way to access that data. That's correct. Yeah, the property is simply a way of gaining access to the variable for either setting it or retrieving it. And the actual data storage itself is stored in this local variable up here. Okay, so it becomes a, a, a local variable for that. We call them instance variables because it's specific to the class that we create, or sorry, it's specific to the object that we create. So yeah, no storage takes place in here at all. We also have the ability to say that, you know what, some of these uh, properties are read-only. In other words, you can't set the value. We've set it in code, and in which case what we would do is just simply not include that setter. So you would only have a get in here. Likewise, we can remove the get and simply have a set. So we can make something write-only versus read-only or versus read-write. All right. So we have in here uh, a getter and setter or a property for type, for the weight, and for the color of our animal. Now, we also talked about some behavior. So here's the behavior that we're focusing on. We have a couple of what are known as instance methods. So we have one called make noise, and we have one called move. Now, these are relatively simple. All they're going to do is output to a, uh, a console window some text based on if when the user calls it. So if we were to call animal.make noise, we would see printed out on the screen, animal is making noise. If we were to call move, then we would simply print out on the screen, animal is moving. So again, that's just a quick and simple representation of creating a class in code. And, and this is an animal class like we had on the screen uh, on, the, uh, on the slide deck momentarily ago. And we have our member uh, variables known as the data or the describing attributes. And we have ways of getting and setting them, which are create the encapsulation or that, that data hiding for us, um, allowing us to, to control access to it. 
and then we have the functionality such as make noise and move. And that public keyword is what makes those an interface so that users can actually get at the, the properties and the methods. Yeah, good point, and, that, and that's exactly correct in that if you see a keyword public, and again, this is the C-sharp syntax. Mm -hmm. um, other programming languages use similar, but the, the word might be a little bit different. But it does. Is That's what allows the other programmers or your program code to gain access to these is because they're public as opposed to private. Okay, so that was, uh, again, a quick and simple look at creating a class. And the next thing we talked about was the concept of inheritance in, in object-oriented programming. And inheritance is exactly what the word sounds like, if you're familiar with it, from thinking about things you inherit from your family. Now, we're not talking about, you know, you inheriting a million dollars from your grandfather when he, when he passes away. What we're referring to here is attribute, kind of attribute and behavior inheritance. And if you take a look at the color of your eyes, the color of your hair, and some of your mannerisms, the way you speak, the way you do certain things, those are typically inherited from a parent, from a grandparent, right? And classes kind of function the same way. So when we talk about the inheritance in object-oriented programming, the data, which is the attributes, and the behavior are taken from another class. This creates the concept of what we refer to as superclasses and subclasses or base class and a derived class. There's you know, different terms that you can use for it, but a, a superclass or a base class becomes sort of the parent, and the derived class or subclass becomes the class that does the inheriting. It's, it's the one that, that collects those values from the parent class or from the superclass. And if, what it does is by creating or by supporting inheritance, it allows the programmer, it allows you to create a, a common base class that has functionality that would be common across a bunch of different subclasses and, and allows for code reuse. So you would create this basic functionality. In our example, the animal class, we chose, it's, there's a type of an animal, the animal has a color and it has a weight, and it has two methods called, you know, make noise and move. And make noise and move were very generic because we don't know what kind of animal it is that we might create we can use inheritance and start creating different types of animals such as a dog or a cat or a horse and we can inherit those characteristics from the animal class because a dog is an animal and a horse is an animal so they have common traits and this is where the inheritance comes into play in that we create that base class or that super class with the common aspects functionality and attributes and then we can reuse those in our other classes that become subclasses, and we don't have to write that code again. We'll see that in the example here in just a minute when we talk about um, um, demonstrating you know, how we do inheritance within the code itself. So, having said that, let's look at what inheritance looks like in the code. So again, here's our animal class. This is what we just looked at. We created this as with, with the thought in mind that this would become a base class or a super class. Then we also created this thing called a dog class. Now, just so you know, there's no you know, smoke and mirrors here. All of the, the implementation that I have for my dog class is commented out. That's, that's what the green text means. That's what these two you know, forward slashes mean in, in C-sharp is it's commenting, commenting this code out. As far as the compiler is concerned, this code doesn't exist. It's just textual information for me to read. But I wanted to show you that the, the dog class has nothing written in it. So it, in essence, the dog class should not be able to demonstrate functionality or attributes. But it can, and it does so because I have said I want my dog to inherit from the animal class. And that's what this colon and the animal word is doing here in this particular line of code. This is uh, C-sharp's syntax. I find that very hard to say fast, C-sharp syntax. Um, but this is the way C-sharp handles inheritance, is it says, give me the name of the class you're going to create, put a colon in there, and tell me the class you want to inherit from. So the reason why I did it this way and commented everything out in Doug was because what I wanted to show you was as we start to implement this in code, now we're going to use a feature that is present in Visual Studio that's known as IntelliSense. And IntelliSense in Visual Studio provides functionality for us that makes our coding job so much easier uh, you know, once you get used to this, you're not going to want to code in an environment that doesn't have this because it, it adds in um, 
functionality in the, in, in the integrated development environment of Visual Studio that lets you pick and choose attributes and functionality from code without you having to remember what all it was that that particular piece of, or, or the, the, in this case, what the class actually has available to it. As an example, let's, let's go ahead and create a new Doug here for a second. So I'll go Doug, and we'll call him Spot, and we'll say equals new Doug. And this is the syntax for instantiating an object of the Doug class. So this is what we refer to in object-oriented programming as instantiation. The Doug is the blueprint. Spot is the instance of a Doug that I have decided to create in my code. So we have a dog now called Spot, and you can consider Spot as your dog running around your living room as opposed to the generic dog when you think of a, you know, a dog as an animal type. And so now what we do is we say, okay, I want to access some of the attributes or the functionality of the dog. So my instance is called Spot. So I say Spot dot, and here's that IntelliSense in action. So it pops up this little um, dialog box in the middle that lists all of the functionality available to my dog object. You'll notice that we have color, make noise, move, type, and weight. But I did not create those in my dog class. I created those, remember, in my animal class. Type, weight, color, and our methods down here. Dog actually has access to them because we said it inherits functionality and attributes from animal. This is inheritance in action, okay? So I have the ability in my program to say spot.color equals brown. So I've just given my dog a color, but my dog doesn't implement anything to do with the color attribute. It's available in the dog class because my dog is a type of animal. Right? So again, that gives you an example of inheritance in action. We also said we wanted to talk a little bit about polymorphism. And this is another key aspect of object-oriented programming. The, if you break the word down, poly means many, multiple. So it, you know, we, we can have multiple of something. And morph means to change. So essentially polymorphism means that we can have multiple versions, different versions of the same thing. What does that mean in our classes? Well, polymorphism basically means a behavior change or an attribute change. That's what we're referring to. We've already seen how we created the base class of an animal, and we've seen how we inherited the behavior and the functionality uh, and attributes from the animal class into our dog class but we can also make changes to our dog class that suits what we want it to do. And as an example, let's go ahead and do a quick demo of polymorphism itself. So we'll switch back over to Visual Studio. And let's go back in and look at our dog class again for a second. And now here's where we'll start implementing some of that polymorphic behavior, if you will. We know that a dog has the ability to have attributes that might be slightly different from an animal. And in that case, we have something called a breed. So if we were to uncomment this code so that it becomes a part of our class, our dog class now actually has a breed. And if we come back into, actually it's a good idea just to quickly say between them so that the program knows about the changes. If I come back and I say spot dot, Notice that I have now added breed. Where it wasn't there before, breed is there now. So I've now actually changed my attributes of my dog class to be different from the animal class. Animal does not have breed, although it could have, but in this instance it doesn't, but dog has. So I can set the breed to, you know, German Shepherd, Chihuahua, whatever. So this is customizing my dog class to what I want it to be, how I want it to function. And if you instantiated animal, animal would not have breed, but dog would. That is correct, and, and that's a good point, Paul. So if we come back and we said, I wanted to create a new animal class called my animal, and we create a new animal class, and we come back in and we say my animal dot, all we see is what the animal implements. So it implements, you know, color, make noise, move, type, and weight. 
but it didn't implement the breed that our dog class actually has, right? So that's, that's an important distinction to make in that when we do implement polymorphism and we change our subclasses, we do not change the superclass, okay? We're not, we're not impacting that at all. Now, polymorphism also provides us with the ability to change functionality. And here's an example of adding a new method to the dog class, again, that animal didn't have. It's called wagtail. And, you know, we could put in our console.write line here, which is, you know, our, our implementation of saying, you know, uh, dog wags tail. And, oops, that just adds, that adds the functionality for the dog. Animal doesn't have a wagtail method. But, Here's an interesting aspect of, of how polymorphism comes into play and, and different programming languages will implement this slightly differently, but we have something here called public override void make noise. And if you remember from our animal class, we did have that method called make noise, okay? And we declared it as a virtual method. This is the way C Sharp handles our uh, polymorphism and the, and the ability to change things as we can create virtual methods Virtual methods can be overridden in a subclass, and that basically means that we can change what that behavior is. If we go back and we look at the dog class, we can see that we've changed here and we've said, you know, console.writeline bark. So this is a change in the make noise behavior that we want our dog to do. So the dog has a specific noise that it makes, whereas an animal has a generic make noise. This is an example of, again, polymorphism in action. We've changed the functionality from our dog class or from the animal class to what we want our dog to actually work on or, or to do specifically. So as an example, if we were to say, uh, in this case, um, my animal, and I can't type today, so let's use IntelliSense to make things much easier. And we said we wanted to use the make noise method. You'll notice that, ooh, what's that gonna do for us? Which noise are we going to make? Well, if we were to execute that, this code, and, and unfortunately I don't have everything written in here to, to make this work, um, is, so you would actually see all of it functioning correctly, the, the animal would actually, or what, sorry, what we would have here is the, the animal's sentence would be making that noise. So let's just run a control F5. Here you see as it builds, animal is making noise, right? If we step back into our animal class, we see that's exactly what's taking place here. However, if in my program I also wrote uh, spot dot make noise, what do we think would happen here? Well, as we execute this code, we can see that the animal makes the noise, but the dog barks. So that's our change in behavior. This is, this is where we're getting that functionality from. And the thing to note here is that it's the same method call. It's both make noise for, for the dog and the animal, mm -hmm. but the, the line that's being written to the screen is, is different based on that polymorphism. Yeah. Yeah. And again, that's, that's the behavioral change, if you will, that allows us to customize what our subclasses or our derived classes have the ability to do. And, and that's where that functionality gets built into it. So this, uh, this section here has been a kind of a quick overview of object-oriented programming where we've discussed the fundamentals of classes, what it, what it means to create a class, what an object is. We've talked about encapsulating data and behavior and, and you know, how that kind of does data hiding and, and allows us to kind of control what users do with our classes. We give a demonstration of inheritance, how we can create a base class with specific functionality and have a derived class go through the process of inheriting that functionality and gaining access to the attributes and the behaviors without needing to write that same functionality in our subclass. So again, it's code reuse. It's a way of, of you know, uh, reducing the amount of code you have to write. And then we looked at changing the behavior of the derived classes through the use of polymorphism and, and the changing of behaviors and the changing of data types. So that's it for uh, module number three on object-oriented programming. And so we, we hope you'll come back and join us for the next module. Paul, we're going to take a look at uh, demoing web applications. Sounds like fun. Sounds like fun. See you soon.
Hi, and welcome to the Microsoft Virtual Academy session on software development fundamentals. My name is Jerry O'Brien, a technical content development manager here at Microsoft, and I'm joined by Paul. Hi, I'm Paul Party. I'm a content development lead at Microsoft. And uh, we're going to kick this session off focusing on module four of the software development series fun, uh, fundamentals series. And this one will focus on web applications. So it's important from the perspective of considering your career in software development to know the different types of applications that you might be involved in creating. And that's what these uh, next few modules will, will cover. So we'll talk about web applications specifically in this module, and we'll cover other types in, in the modules that follow. Uh, but what we're going to take a look at here from this perspective on, on web applications basically is a quick overview of web page construction and talk a little bit about the difference between HTML versus a, an actual ASP.NET or a web application itself. And then we'll gain an understanding um, kind of a high level of ASP.NET, which is Microsoft's platform for web applications, which will kind of help you understand a little bit of the differences between just a core HTML page and an actual web application that does, has some functionality. Uh, we'll talk briefly about how those sites are hosted on the different platforms. In this case, we'll focus on uh, Microsoft's platform or Internet Information Services. And we just want to gain an understanding of how the hosting of this information takes place on a web server itself. And then finally, we'll take a quick look at uh, what a web service is, so an introduction to what they are and how they provide functionality within um, the, the programming world. So simple web pages, when we consider the web itself, where, where the World Wide Web initially, initially came from, I almost said initiated, uh, where, it, where it initially came from was through the use of static documents. And the static documents were created in a language known as HTML or hypertext markup language. And although the pages were static, they, cr they actually uh, consisted of hypertext markup language and, the, and those contained hyperlinks, which allowed you to click on a link and navigate to another place on the internet to gain access to whatever information was uh, maybe stored at that particular location and time. And again, it's important to just kind of look at it from the perspective of HTML being static documents versus web applications. And we'll show the difference between the two, although web applications are actually consist of, in, from the user interface perspective, HTML as well. So with web page construction, there's, especially with the, with the uh, introduction of HTML5, which is the latest standard from the World Wide Web Consortium, which is the group of folks who maintain the standards uh, for HTML and, and for uh, web technologies. HTML5 now includes three technologies that complement each other. And there's HTML, or the Hypertext Markup Language. There's CSS, known as Cascading Style Sheets. And then there's JavaScript, which adds functionality to our applications. So from the perspective of what each does specifically, HTML itself is intended to be uh, more semantic. It's designed to talk about what the structure of your web page looks like, what that document should actually look like, um, and, and it includes tags that provide that structure. The CSS is Cascading Style Sheets, is what's responsible for applying the look, if you will, of the HTML page itself. So it's responsible for saying, how the elements on the page will look specifically. And it's known as cascading style sheets because it, we, you know, we, we can talk about inheritance and, and object-oriented programming concepts, but cascading style sheets also talks about an inherited method or a parent-child relationship between the styles that are applied. So if we have style, styles applied at the page level for the HTML page, those styles are applied at that parent level. And then elements within the HTML, such as you know, the paragraph elements that we have or individual div elements that we might create, each one of those become a child of that parent page, that HTML. And we can apply styles at the individual attribute level or the individual HTML element level as well. And this creates that cascading effect. So we might apply a text color of blue to all, H or all body text of the page but then get into a paragraph element and change that color to red, in which case that overrides the previous one. So the they styles kind of, and this is where that cascading comes into, they fall through what's known as a document object model. So the HTML, 
the JavaScript and the CSS are all interpreted by the web browsers to display what you see on the page when you view it in Internet Explorer, uh, you know, Firefox, whatever your favorite browser may be. So let's go ahead and take a quick peek at an HTML demo so you can get an idea of what we're referring to. Jerry, before we get into the, the demo specifically, can you talk a little bit about um, state versus stateless, particularly given the concepts that we covered in previous modules? Um, I'm interested in here and just having the, the beginning user understand the difference between a stateless machine and a state one that uh, will maintain state between sessions. Yeah, so that's, that's a good question, Paul. And so what Paul is referring to in terms of state and stateless, um, state refers to the ability of tracking, if you will, uh, specific information about what you're doing. So when you open up an application locally on your computer, you can have that application store information about what you're doing, so it becomes locally stored on that computer, and then when you open that application back up, it, it can come right back to where you were. So as an example, if you have a, a Windows Phone application or if you have an iPhone application that you were you know, uh, in the process of taking a picture of something and you took the picture and you had saved it, and then a phone call came in right in the middle of doing something with the picture, which meant that whatever that application was that you were doing ends up in the background. When you come back to that application, the state information tells the app how to get back to where it was that you were and what you were doing specifically. So it might open up the last picture that you took, or it might take you in, in terms of if you were browsing the web, it, it should take you back to the page that you were actually browsing. Uh, and the other thing that Paul is referring to is when we get into web applications, typically they used to be uh, stateless, which meant that they didn't really track where you were and what you were doing. And a good example of that is if you open up your, your internet browser and you browsed off to you know, the Microsoft Store site because you wanted to buy the latest Surface tablet that's available, and you close down Internet Explorer, the next time you opened it up, it's not going to go back to that Microsoft Store website you know, with the items in your shopping cart because it's, it's stateless. Um, you have to have a way of determining where you were, were, what you were doing, and so you have to have a way of storing state information. Now, over the years, we've changed to storing it in things called cookies on the computer. Some people hate them. They're little you know, text files that get stored on the computer that contain that specific state information. So if you've ever visited a website and you had the ability to customize the view of it or if you visited an e-commerce site and you're adding items to your shopping cart and your browser session ends for some reason and you come back in and you go, hey, I signed back in and oh, oh, there's my shopping cart stuff. So they knew exactly what I had. That's an example of the web application is now implementing stateful information into it. So is that going to answer your question, Paul? Yeah, and I think there's just an important concept to keep in mind as you go from desktop programming to web programming because the way that you maintain state between sessions and the way, way, way you maintain your data is going to be very critical um, and understanding that concept early I think will be helpful. Yeah, yeah, great. So, you know, so kind of a great question, uh, you know, to, to make sure you've got it clear in your mind. They are a couple of different, they're different programming models and you will have to be aware of that as you start coding in web applications, um, how you maintain that user state and, and how you have the ability to get them back to where they were. So on our screen, if we switch over to our Visual Studio, we can see an example of uh, just a, a, about as simple as you can get for an HTML page, um, not as simple as they come because I've, I have added a couple of extra components in here. but. We know it's an HTML page because of this HTML5 declaration at the top that says doc type HTML. Um, we have tags in here, so HTML, head, title, body. These are known as HTML elements or HTML tags, and, and they, again, lay out the semantic structure of the page. We have a head element which talks about this is the header portion of our, of our HTML page. And within the header portion, we can expect certain things to be present in there, such as the title tag. The title tag is something that tells us when we open this page in the web browser, this is what will be displayed in the tab. So if we have a tab browser experience, right, or in the title bar of a, of a non-tab browser. We also have an H1 tag. This is an example of kind of almost in a sense, if you will, breaking a little bit of the rules. Uh, for separating semantic and presentation, where you know H1 specifically tells the browser that I want this text to be displayed 
a certain way. And your browsers will interpret it differently and you have the uh, ability to completely customize that in your browser to say how big you want this H1 to look, if you want a bold text or not, or what have you. Um, but the P element is an example of, again, coming back to structure. It's a paragraph. We're telling the HTML browser when you display this, this is a paragraph that should be physically separated somehow on the page from anything else. So if we take a quick peek at this, let's just right click and go a hey, view and browser and pop up Internet Explorer. And so we can see here's our generic page. Here's our header H1 and Internet Explorer says H1 should be a certain size and it should be in bold text and a paragraph tag should just follow the standard normal text, whatever the user has configured in their browser. Um, and you'll notice that there is a space separating the two values here. So that's kind of what the, the P does was it, it gave it that physical separation. And, and the reason you don't see the tags here is, is based on what something Jerry said uh, in, the, in the previous slide. The browser interprets those tags and then displays what's between them on the web page. So all the tagging is behind the scenes and is interpreted by the browser. And, and many browsers will interpret tags differently. That's why what you see in Firefox may not look the same in Internet Explorer and vice versa. Yeah, and, and that's a good point, too, because you will find that different browsers will render different HTML elements not precisely the same. And as Paul mentioned, you know, you don't see the HTML tags in here, but if you were to right-click in your browser, in this case, Internet Explorer offers it this way, Firefox may have a different menu in Chrome, etc. But if you select View Source, you can see that what was sent to the web browser is pretty much exactly what it was that I had you know, typed into my Visual mm -hmm. Studio window. So behind the scenes, the browser reads this text, but it displays this, all right? So as Paul mentioned, it's hiding all of that uh, structure behind the scenes. It's, it's, you know, the user doesn't need to see these tags because they really don't care, and it adds clutter and makes it difficult to see. So again, that's just kind of the, the very basic uh, HTML page that we, uh, you know, we can show you and, and to give you an idea of how it kind of remains a little on the static side. When we start talking about getting into ASP.NET web applications, we can start delving a little bit deeper into what we can do with our web applications. And these, the concept of application should really um, denote to you functionality. So an application has functions. It has the ability for you to interact with it and do different things, whereas the static HTML page really is text and hyperlinks and maybe images and you click on things and it takes you someplace else. The, you might consider that a certain amount of interactivity, but certainly not as close as what a web application provides. So let's have a look at the differences where we take a look at what an ASP.NET uh, application really consists of. ASP.NET is really kind of a server-side framework and we can have functionality in our web application that is server-side or client-side. And that simply talks about where the code gets executed. And server-side means that we have code written and it sits on the server that is serving up the web pages and it processes all of that information. Client-side means that we have code that exists in the HTML page itself and it will be executed on the client side. So we don't have to go back to the server to, to do this whole execution process. Um, so ASP.NET, provides that web application functionality through dynamic content. It allows the user to interact with what they're looking at. It allows them to uh, do certain things that they want to do within, within the application, such as filling out forms and you know clicking on a submit button and having some functionality to take place from, from that perspective. And, and we'll see it a little bit in the demo as well. The a web application, including ASP.NET technologies, use uh, a couple of different aspects. So we still use HTML. We still have that displayed in the browser, which provides that functionality, or not functionality, but the user interface aspect that, that our viewers actually see. But it also deals with something called code behind, and this is where that functionality exists, is that we have the ability to add the interactivity, the processing components, and those all sit in what ASP.NET refers to as a code behind file. So it could be C Sharp or, or Visual Basic code that runs in the background that, again, as we mentioned earlier with the HTML uh, tags, you don't see those being rendered in the browser itself. In order for ASP.NET to provide this type of functionality, 
uh, it has to be hosted on an application server. And ASP.NET is hosted on Internet Information Services um, that Microsoft makes available as the, as the platform for hosting websites itself. Um, and ASP.NET also builds into it uh, what's referred to as data connectivity, which means that we have functionality within ASP.NET in the programming environment to connect to data sources such as databases, flat files, or what have you, to actually render the content or, or do the processing that we need specifically for our application. So let's do a quick demo of an ASP.NET application. We'll pop out to Visual Studio again. And um, again, you know, this the index.html was this just this raw HTML page that we went through the process of creating. But when we start looking at ASP.NET, we'll find that our files take on names like default.aspx, and that .aspx is an extension that says this is an ASP.NET web page or, or functionality. Take note that the um, content here is a little more involved than what we saw on our basic uh, web page, on the basic HTML content. We actually have tags in here such as ASP con uh, content itself, but we also have it interspersed with HTML tags, so you recognize the P element from earlier on. If we take a look at this page here, in order to actually see it rendered in, in the browser, we would want to execute the web application by running it from within Visual Studio. So by clicking on the Run button, we will actually, we're still firing up um, you know, the, the web browser to display this. But the thing that was interesting to note is here now, instead of just looking at a file, we actually have something called localhost. And Visual Studio includes this little component. You'll see this little new icon down here that says IIS Express. This is a smaller version of Internet Information Services that allows us to serve up web pages on our development machines. In a production environment, you would have a, you know, typically a Windows Server um, operating system running on the back end, and you would have a full version of Internet Information Server executing on that, and you would deploy your web application to that. But as we take a look at this page that's displayed, there's, there's some, definitely some HTML in here. There's definitely a lot of HTML in here. Again, if we you know, right-click and go View Source, you can see that there's a, a way more um, HTML, way more uh, content in here than what was in our basic page. And this is where we're getting that functionality uh, from a web application perspective. It's also important to note that we've got some nice background colors in some of our headers, like in, in this ASP.NET header. We've got a button here that has, <coughs> excuse me, has a nice little blue color to it. And so some of that functionality is all implemented through the use of style sheets. And again, if we take a quick source view, we'll take a look and see that we have these things called CSS files and style sheets that are in our code up here at the top. Those style sheets are what are responsible for providing that that display or that color, if you will, um, to our application itself. Do a quick pop out into Visual Studio here again for just one second, and let's stop running that application for a moment. We'll go back and look at our index.html, and to give you an idea in something that's a little bit cleaner and, and not as, as, uh, as cluttered as all of that other code was, I'm going to uncomment this line of code which is similar to what you just looked at. So we have content style sheets, and this what this does is this links a style sheet into my HTML page. And you remember when we looked at this in the first time, all we basically saw was these two text values on a white background. Well, this style sheet onecss actually exists in my project. So when we take a look at um, all of everything that we have available, you know, we've got a bunch of different folders that contain uh, all kinds of bits and pieces of information that support this web application itself. But under this content folder is where we see all of these style sheets. And it's just a way of separating everything so it's easier for us to find. So this style sheet onecss is about as simple as you can get for CSS. And all it does is says, look, anytime you apply this to an HTML page, if there is a body tag, then I want you to set its background color to blue. You want to see what that looks like, let's right click and view this in the browser. And we see a white background. Why do we see a white background? Maybe we need to save it. I love it when demos work. And I think you're right, Paul. We should save that. 
and the style sheet is present. It is in content. We right click and view that in browser again. Try refresh. It could be. There we go. It was cached. Mm -hmm. All right. So we cached the. We, we had the previous page cached. Paul is is right on cue for that. I completely forgot about caching. Uh -huh. um, so it, it kept an old version uh, in in the browser cache. So by refreshing, we get rid of the cached version, bring in the newest one. And as ugly as it looks, you can see that our CSS did did work. We do have a blue background on our page, right? And it was applied to this body tag. It's essentially what it was. Now we also talked about some of the functionality that a web application consists of and how ASP.NET supports that, uh, supports the HTML5 standards through the use of JavaScript, right? So let's go ahead and execute that ASP.NET page again so that when we look at it, oh sorry, we were in looking at the wrong one. I want default.aspx to be the page that pops up here. So default ASPX comes up again after much churning. There we go. And this is still pretty much just generic static HTML content, although it's laid out. CSS does a very nice job of presenting this in a visually compelling way. But these buttons, if you take a look, and I think we can just barely see, but if I hover over this button, down in the lower left-hand corner of the screen, you'll see it's just a hyperlink. So the button's only going to take us to another page. It doesn't really demonstrate web app functionality. But if I want to log into this website, here's where we start looking at functionality that exists within the application itself. So HTML provides the presentation here, which gives us our text we see on the screen and these uh, text boxes for inputting the values that are in here. And when we click on the login button, it's going to require some processing on the back end of the server. So this is where the server side functionality comes into play. I don't have a user account, so I want to register for a new user account. And again, this is an example of functionality. Even though clicking on that register took me to another HTML page, this one here will have functionality written in the background that allows me to specify a username and a password. And I'm just on purpose, I'm going to leave this password blank for a second to show you something. But if I had filled it in and I clicked on register, this would send a request out to the server and it would say, here's a username and a password, and I want you to do some processing with that. So create a new account with GeoBrian as the username, and whatever value is passed in, here's the password, hash it so that it's secure, nobody sees it, and store that in the system so that the user now has an account. That's an example of functionality that's taking place on the back end, on the server side, right? It doesn't happen on the user computer. And so that information will get stored on the server in a database somewhere. It doesn't get stored as a cookie on my computer. This is, is an example of server-side processing. But an example of client-side processing using something called JavaScript is what we'll demonstrate now. So when I click on the register button, first thing it says, would I like to store my password for localhost? This is just a standard Internet Explorer dialog that pops up for security purposes. Um, it's important to note that if I did say yes, my password would be stored locally using cookie information, okay? Um, but it's, it's not related to server-side processing, so let's just say no for this site. What I wanted you to see was because I did not fill in the second password option, I now have some red text that popped up on the screen, one that says the confirmed password field is required. And I've actually, I see it in two different places here. And this is an example of some JavaScript code that was actually executed. If we right click and go view source again, we won't necessarily step through each and every uh, aspect of the, of the JavaScript functionality, but see this tag that's called script and the components that sit within it, okay? This is an example of JavaScript. This is client-side functionality that actually goes through the process of executing on the client side. JavaScript is a client side scripting language, so it functions on that. And this is what's known as an inline script because the code for the function here is actually written in the HTML, but there's also a, the ability to bring in external JavaScript files, and that's where you'll see this example. So script source equals, and then there's this big long string which actually points to a file called MS Ajax JS, which is, is a Microsoft implementation of JavaScript located in the bundles folder of our project itself. So again, it's just an example of a bunch of JavaScript components that execute. And that 
function that when we submit it the form on submit, it executes some validation functions. And the reason we want to do that on the client side is because we don't want to have to go all the way back to the server, creating network traffic, the potential for slowing down the user experience on this. But stuff that we can validate on the client side, we do so with JavaScript. And, and that's what provided that functionality for us. And, and by client side, you just mean the local user's uh, browser, Internet Explorer. And server side is the actually the web server that's serving up all the content, correct? Yeah, exactly. So client side means your browser on your computer. Server side means the, the server that's actually hosting and it, it. And in the environment you're in here, your computer serving is both client and server because it's a development environment. But normally, those would be separated. I think you mentioned that before, but I just want to be clear about that. Exactly, yeah. So when we talked about down here, this, this little um, icon that showed up, uh, right here, which was called the IIS Express. That's an example of the my my computer, the demo computer here, is serving as both client and server. That's right. Yeah, but it's not the typical environment that you'll you'll run into. So, all right. So that's a kind of a quick and dirty look at ASP.NET and web applications. And so hosting the websites is something that we focus on from the perspective of you know which server is going to host the website, um, you know, and, and the one that's going to be responsible for serving it up. So hosting the websites, you know, are typically done, as, as we mentioned with um, the example that we just showed for ASP.NET, we have an actual local development version, Express, kind of a lightweight Internet Information Server um, hosting the, the system that's set up here. Typically, you'll have server operating systems in the back end that will be hosting uh, these websites and these web applications. We talked about IIS, which is Microsoft's implementation of it, but if you're running on a Linux machine, maybe you're going to run Apache. So there, there's a bunch of different types of uh, website hosting or server hosting applications that exist out there. And all they do is they sit on the server as a service. There's usually not a user interface for it. There may be configuration tools, but they sit there and they host the application code and they host the interface. Think about when you visit a website, you simply type in the URL. So you could go to HTTP, uh, www.microsoft.com, and that goes through all that whole internet process communication of DNS servers and you know routers and trying to get to where it is, and it finally gets to Microsoft's web server. Now there's a software application, IIS, sitting on that web server, listening on a specific port. So it's listening for communications to come in. And it gets the request for serving up that default page for Microsoft.com. And it says, hey, I need to establish now a communication with this client computer. And it establishes the communication by accepting the connection and then sending back the HTML that the user simply requested. And so, you know, we get this two-way communication. I want to see something. Here's what you wanted to see. Thank you very much. The important thing to remember, and this goes back to Paul's conversation about state and stateless, is that once the web server has sent you back the HTML, it completely forgets about you. It's done. It doesn't care about you anymore. You've got the data. I'm going to sit and, and listen and wait for somebody else to come in and, and request. You may also not realize that when you connect to a website that hosts HTML text and images, for every image that exists on that web page, you're making another connection to the web server. So if you had 20 images on a on a, say the default web page for a particular website, you'll make an initial connection for the HTML page and then you'll hit 20 more connections to that same web server just to download each and every one of those individual images. So they become different communication mechanisms. But it's that, it's that web server software, IIS or Apache or whatever you might be using, that is responsible for serving up the data and the requests that come in. All right. So. The last thing we want to talk about in this particular module is a quick focus on web services. And web services are a little bit different than a web application, but a little bit the same. And where they differ from is that a web service typically doesn't have a user interface. So similarities are that a web service is hosted on a web server. And it could be IIS, it could be Apache, it could be whatever. But what it does is it provides programmatic access to certain functionality. Whereas if you connect to a web server to 
work with a web application or view a web page, you're given a GUI environment, some kind of a graphical environment aspect that you're, um, that you're viewing that gets returned to you. When you're interacting with a web service, you're typically doing it as a software developer. Now, that's kind of odd to say that because it doesn't mean to say that users can't interact with web services because you will interact, but you will do it through the context of an application or a program. And to give you an example of what that means is if you think about the uh, NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, is an organization that deals with all kinds of weather stuff. They, they have um, weather charts, radar, um, different bits and pieces of information that focus on forecasting and, and making weather available to folks who need it. They create a web service that hosts certain functionality that programs can make use of to return weather information to them. So I might write a Windows Phone application that displays weather on my phone. It, so I don't have to deal with going outside each and every day and looking at what the weather is and coming back in and writing code and redeploying my application so that you can use it to see what today's weather is, which wouldn't make any sense at all. I code, or I code my application to pull their web services and their web services will accept information from me such as tell me where you are you know so give me give me a zip code um, and I will look up the weather for that zip code and then I will return the weather back to you and maybe my application only makes use of small pieces of it I might only care about what's the forecast what's the temperature and that's it and, and I'll display that in my application I might want to get even more detailed and gain access to more functionality from their, their web services by saying, but I want to see radar images and I want to see you know, what the ceilings and clouds look like or I want to see more detailed information on weather. I can do that simply by calling the necessary functionality and that's known as an API or an application programming interface but in web server or web services terminology is you're accessing the functionality, you're accessing specific services to gain access to the information that you're looking for. Oh. And, and just to build on some of the concepts that we were talking about in a previous module, a web service could just be a collection of classes with publicly available interfaces, which is a concept we talked about last time, that you can call from any program. So you can call it from a website, you can call it from a Windows Phone app or a Windows app, um, and those, those classes will provide you with the functionality. So there'll be properties that we talked about, there'll be methods that you can call, and, and that's how you create your web service. So if you just think of it as a set of classes that are publicly available on the internet, that might help uh, to categorize it with some of the concepts we talked about in the last module. Yeah, and, and that's a good clarification on that too, Paul, because again, it's, the way I keep the two of them separated is a web application is something that is visual and a web service is not, it's programmatic. And, and you know, so I, I keep them separate that way, but again, as Paul mentioned, the web services are typically collections of classes, and those classes have behaviors and functionality, and we simply call those from our code. We don't have to create the classes in our code because they're already created on the web service engine, but we're simply calling that functionality. So this, is, uh, this kind of wraps up this module on web applications, and so you know, what we've taken a look at here is We've talked about what basic HTML is, how the, the new standard of HTML5 incorporates HTML and JavaScript and cascading style sheets all as, as a part of one. And we demonstrated how HTML can be static pages with hyperlinks that send you off to different locations. And then we contrasted that with ASP.NET applications where there's functionality built in, whether it's client side or whether it's server side, but it provides more interactivity for the user uh, rather than just a generic static web page. And then we uh, took a look at how ASP.NET or other web applications are hosted on different servers. And then finally closed out by looking at kind of the differences between a web service and a web application and sort of what the role web services play in today's programming uh, environments. So uh, thanks very much for joining, on this, uh, joining us on this module. And this completes Module 4, and if you come back and join us for the next module, we'll take a look at some of the different desktop type of applications you might work on uh, as a developer in your career.